वेलकम बैक टू चैनल दिस इज ट्रेडी स्टॉम एन ई जी वॉचिंग फर्स्ट पार्ट ऑफ वॉट इफ काकाशी मर्ज विद इज यंगर सेल्फ इफ यू एंजॉय दिस वीडियो प्लीज लाइक शेयर एंड सब्सक्राइब टू दिस चैनल नाउ वेस्टिंग नो टाइम लेट स्टार्ट द स्टोरी सो वट इड यू गेट इस कैप्टन Kakashi raised an eyebrow as he glanced up from the pile of papers. "You're still on medical leave, Genma," he replied. Genma said, "Discharged as of 40 minutes and 30.6 seconds ago." After searching through his hip pouch and extracting a crumpled bundle of documents bearing seals that appeared official, see? The hospital's seals were authentic, and Kakashi could smell the subtle scent of chakra. He said absently, "You know how angry Ito was when you and Rita faked your papers last time." as he walked away from the mission desk and looked absently through the papers the daimyo wanted the quick assassination of a minor lord in grass to end so they asked that it be carried out the customary way he twisted his mouth then it was another swift stab and run with the head and heart packed along so the daimyo could hang it on his wall parade it around the capital or do whatever he wanted with a dead man's remains kakashi wasn't compensated to consider that genma chewed his senbon ferociously the end bouncing up and down like a wind blown leaf i don't even want to think about it he said i still haven't recovered from the last medical evaluation he gave me kakashi cleared his throat and put the papers in a pouch sealing it with a gentle curl of chakra good means the lesson sticking he uttered a quick a rank in and out we've got 4 days shodai's balls don't tell me it's another genma interrupted when kakashi gave him a challenging expression he stuffed his hands in his pockets and shrugged with each word His senbon rose and fell. Didn't think I was getting out so early for another support mission, he muttered. Kakashi remarked, "A mission's a mission." As he became suddenly extremely exhausted, "Tomorrow at 0600, we'll meet at the Northeast Alcove. Pack the usual." Genma slouched away, looking much more dejected, and said, "Yeah, all right. See you tomorrow morning, then, Captain." With the sealed papers pressing insistently at his hip, Kakashi rubbed at the other man's uncovered eye after watching his back vanish behind a corner. Still irritated by the poison gas from the previous mission, he decided to start with Memorial. He was greeted by Sensei, Rin, and Obito. Sharp kanji cuts dug uneasily into his skin as the stone felt cool against his cheek. There was something very familiar about it. Silently, I've got another one, Kakashi said. He licked his lips, and the sweaty material of his mask caught at his tongue. Grass. Do you remember the courier mission we had there, delivering messages to the front line? You tripped over a pod of carnivorous vines and Sensei lost a good chunk of hair trying to rescue you. This one makes 126. He had ripped apart 120.6 chests with his fists and crushed 120.6 hearts in his hand. He occasionally questioned whether Obito had given this gift out of animosity. He could still see every single target, imprisoned by the Sharingan's ruthless accuracy. Close enough to feel a ghostly breath. He could see their pale faces when he closed his eye. He avoided the memorial during those days because he was too irate and resentful to show consideration for the deceased. However, he was pulled back by his guilt and his old, broken promise, which still had sharp edges that could draw blood. "I don't think this is exactly what you had in mind when you gave up your eye," Kakashi remarked, tracing Nohara RIN with his fingertip, the name eroded by rain, wind, and his shaking hand. He said aloofly, "I should go. The team is waiting for me." Hantaru's noble head was also ready to be separated from his body with a swift ninja to stroke. His ankle creaked in protest as he stood up, grimacing and unfolding his long, lanky limbs. Kakashi glanced at the horizon, and the clouds hovering at the edges confirmed what his ankle had suspected. In a few hours it will rain. After adjusting the pack's weight, he lowered his mask and secured it with a chakra string. Hitaki Kakashi vanished, his shock of pale hair vanishing beneath a thick black hood. and Enbu Hound took his place with only a light wind to guide him the boogeyman vanished into the darkness after a swift seal kakashi unfolded the scroll on the floor to reveal blueprints for a vast compound that housed the grass lordling's family 50 samurai guards and 20 or so servants he's summering in a villa about 10 miles from here with his three wives and four children he's expecting something considering that he's gone and hired the kakeru brothers formerly of kiri impressed raida whistled through his teeth Leaning back on his haunches, he stated, "On the bingo books for all the major 5 countries, Genjutsu and Taijutsu combo, real nasty." Genma thought, "That takes some serious Ryu," as he looked up from the rolls of bandages he was restructuring. "Isn't he just supposed to be some minor lord or something?" A minor lord suspected of leading a coup in planning, expressed Kakashi in a low voice. 
Grass's daimyo wants him to be made an example of. Raida sarcastically remarked, well, if he's sending us after him, he must really have it in for him, but his expression was grave as he looked critically at the issue at hand. So what's the plan, boss? Kakashi nodded at the silent figure huddled to his right, a black, cloaked figure wearing a smiling cat mask. Tenzo, I want you to cover the place with your seeds, subdue the samurai and the servants and keep an eye out for any backup. Worse comes to worse, I want the entire place sealed. Of course, Captain. Genma snapped his medical kit shut and slung it over his shoulder. You over. Exert yourself again, don't count on me dragging your sorry ass all the way back to Konoha, he snarled. Getting as bad as the captain about draining yourself high and dry. Tenzo whispered, it was just once, and Kakashi would have thought it sounded petty if it had come from anyone else. Chances are, they'll have the entire place under a low, level genjutsu to alert intruders. Intel says they're under heavy guard here. Kakashi made a quick escape by tapping a small, unassuming looking room in a northwest corner that was conveniently close to a river. I can layer another genjutsu over the top before dispelling it, but it only gives us maybe 10 minutes, tops. You'll have to be in position and cover the entire place before the missing nin realize that security's been compromised. Genma, Raida, you'll be dealing with the Kakeru brothers. Run a hand through his short crop of brown hair and say, you're so good to us, in a dry manner. Like New Year's come early, look at all the presents Captain's giving to us, Genma. Genma groaned, just got my ass out of the hospital, and his mouth twitched like it was chewing on an unseen senbon. Don't want to see Ito's ugly mug for another month at least. Tenzo said, Ito. Sensei probably feels the same way, in a low dot key voice. Judging by the way he nearly had a heart attack over your bed last week. Raida smiled and gave Genma a rib. Sock, look at that, he said. Our little rookie's growing up, making fun of his senpei like that. Mission. Kakashi said, and the upbeat atmosphere was swiftly destroyed by the single word. Under his forehead protector. Obito's eyes stung as he swallowed forcefully. After I deal with the mark and the secondary targets, the missing nin will be the next priority. Make sure to lead them away, out of the compound preferably. Genma said solemnly, yes, captain, with Raida joining in a beat later. Kakashi yelled, scorched earth, and raised his hood. When the primary objectives have been achieved, there are to be no surviving witnesses. Tenzo, you know what to do. Pulling his tiger mask over his face, right aside, by the Shodai, how much gold did the daimyo fork over for this? Tenzo, a lithe black shadow, stood up silently and said, too much, in a hollow voice. Kakashi nodded in silence. He released the genjutsu in the clearing with a chakra twist and gave his team a subliminal cue to leave. In the dark forest light, four black ghosts vanished. It came to life when he opened Obito's eye. Soft tendrils of blue woven through the strands of pale yellow grass surrounding him glowed with vibrant life as colors intensified. He blinked, and the stunning country villa's thin web of chakra a pale, almost ghostly dome of blue came into view. Kakashi watched his chakra reserves carefully in the back of his mind, which were already diminishing with each passing second. He woven the strands slowly and carefully until he had a net that glowed in his hands as bright as Minato. Sensei's eyes. The seals appeared on their own chakra enveloping his fingers with a familiar burn. Taking a quick breath caused it to drift away from him on a soft evening breeze before gently settling over the chakra dome. The world abruptly darkened, becoming ordinary and banal, as Kakashi severed the thread that bound him to his creation and shut Obito's eye. With a flick of his fingers, Kakashi gestured to Tenzo, and the shadowy figure by his side expanded into the sky. Raida and Genma waited dutifully at Kakashi's side, chakra tightly leashed, as he kept watch for six long, tense minutes. Kakashi could smell the tension, a thick musk of anticipation and fear, even though they were too well, trained to show it. The signal finally arrived. Tenzo had two clear and ready chakra flares. Silently exhaling, Kakashi waved a finger at the pair behind him. It's time to hunt. Kakashi's cloak fluttered in the wind as he followed Raida after Genma's hand briefly passed over his shoulder. With a small blip, Kakashi felt Tenzu's chakra coil up on the roof as he carefully opened his senses. The missing nin were sitting idly by the northwest corridor, but Genma and Raida were moving through the compound with ease. Now was the moment. With well. Honed ease, he slithered through the grass, which swayed slightly in time with the wind. He slipped through an open window with a seal and a burst of chakra, carefully avoiding a servant girl who was bound and lay on the floor, immobilized by a pale fleck of wood that was bound to her forehead. 
The front of her dress was wet with urine as she gazed up at him with wide, terrified eyes. Tenzo had one less to manage, which was better. Kakashi stooped to carefully cut her throat with a kanai. Blood. Stained strands of her dark brown hair stuck to his kanai as he carefully wiped them off her sleeve. Her chin was cut, as Aina. He was squandering time. Holding his weapon tightly, Kakashi moved into the shadows and mentally followed the map. From left to right, past the main gardens and the courtyard, chakra flared in the distance, bright and hard, and he heard the clang of steel on steel and an angry shout. The guests were being amused by Raida and Genma. With a grunt, Kakashi accelerated, disregarding the civilians who were strewn about the house like shattered dolls. There was the more crucial goal to consider, and he had already dealt with a good quarter of them. Fucking Konoha. He felt a prick in the back of his neck. The air seemed to get heavier and thicker, swirling mist bound into a growing fog and killing intent. They were too loud for famously silent Kiri killers. As he got closer to the northwest corridor, which was speckled with ash blooms and kanai and shuriken, he clicked his tongue. Even without Obito's eye, he could see the skillful ink edging the wooden frame, protecting and guarding the plane. Looking rice. Paper door that pulsed fairly with seals. An ideal prison. He produced a packet of seals he had invented a few missions prior from a hip pouch. The grass lord would remain inside with a few adjustments that would keep outsiders out. The paper illuminated as he ran a finger down the center of the seal, causing the edges to glow a faint shade of blue. Each cardinal point is represented by one. Kakashi took a step back and used a hand seal to turn on the network. A burst of chakra illuminated the dim hallways, and he entered the room. Don't worry Chio. Chan. The mark said calmly as he held a child in the very best silk robes. The bodyguards will take care of everything, we'll be just fine. Kakashi moved into the light and away from the shadows. He opened Obito's eye and said, Tonight, judgment has been passed upon you and your family, in a dignified manner. No no. Every frantic breath, perspiration drop, and yell was etched in his memory. She staggered toward the shivering huddle of wives and screaming infants in the rear of the room after Mark shoved his child behind him. Guards, guards. It's no use, stated Kakashi. Monkey, rabbit, ox. The scream of a thousand chirping birds filled the air, and the strong odor of fear was nearly overpowered by the scent of sharp ozone. Mark took a step forward, his foot lifting off the floor. Kakashi shifted. With one arm cradling the mark's shoulder and the other piercing the man's chest, Kakashi held the mark's foot in midair. Blood spattered his mask and trickled over his dark cloak. It was seeping into his face mask. He gently withdrew his arm and placed the man on the floor. The deep blue robes, appropriate for a daimyo, were soaked by the blood that gathered on the floor. Lay down your tanto, Kakashi said, still crouching on the ground, as he unwrapped his ninjutsu. Behind him, the woman wobbled on her feet, her small chakra spiking wildly. You, you cannot harm, the children. He sprang up from the floor and slammed it into the woman's ribs, angled precisely to strike her lungs. In a haunting parallel to her husband, she let out a choked sigh and fell to the ground. A child began to cry out behind her. He summoned his chakra with a deep, shuddering breath and fed it into Obito's eye with a fierce burst, creating a thick genjutsu that covered the women and children and provided them with a final rest. The girl stopped crying. Now, there was only silence. Obito's eyes sucked ravenously at Kakashi's chakra, feeding greedily as his head began to pound. After a moment of hesitation, he shook his head. He could feel Tenzo hovering over them all, keeping watch, while Genma and Raida swirled and clashed in the distance. He had to lead his team out of this bloody mess and finish the mission. He dropped to his knees on the ground and got to work. Kakashi was familiar enough with Genma's distinct body language to read the twitches in her shoulder. What took you so long? Kakashi replied with a shrug. The daimyo would soon have his proof. The containment scrolls were securely stored in his pack. One of the brothers sneered and blasted Kakashi's kanai away with an almost insulting ease, asking, what's this, another one? Like cockroaches, the way you seem to pop up everywhere. As Raida aimed a precise kick at the ninja's head, Kakashi ducked down just in time to spit a fireball at the missing dot nin. He gave Raida a shady look as the blow almost knocked his hood back. Kakeru sighed slightly and leaned back at a nearly 90 degree angle to avoid the attack. Now you're just starting to bore me, he said. Kakashi squinted at the shadow that the fireball momentarily lit up. He gestured to Genma and slipped into the ground, substituting a clone. Dampening down as tightly as he could, he reappeared a few yards behind Kakeru and his clumsily shaped shadow. From behind, 
it was evident how the man played with them, slipping away from every punch and ninjutsu as if he had all the time in the world. His clones, Raida and Genma, collaborated effortlessly to contain the Kakeru. As if his rivals simply couldn't keep up with his speed. Kakashi suppressed a frustrated sigh. As if they were slightly too slow, he allowed his clone to blow up in a lightning storm. Flaring his chakra and snapping the Jinjutsu threads that wound obnoxiously around him and his team, Kakeru flinched. Raida went in for the kill, his kick landing firmly on the man's chest, and the missing dot nin shuddered as Kakashi's chakra swept over him. Following Genma's quick maneuver around him, a shower of Senbon sprayed his torso. Shivering, Kakeru's shadow lifted from the earth and clung to his body in a protective embrace. With his brother's blood running through it, it changed into a lean, slender figure. How dare you! Genma pawned a kanai and went for the throat, and Kakashi could almost see his eye roll. Or at least made an effort. Raida's eyes rolled into the back of his head, causing him to collapse onto the ground as his body tensed and the kanai fell out of his grasp. Okay. This was becoming intriguing. The third time, Kakashi opened Obito's eye. Genjutsu Kakeru snarled at his brother and placed him on the ground. Obito's eyes swirled almost languidly as he threw away the Genjutsu, and Kakashi tilted his head, saying, You fucking scum, I'll make you pay for this. For my brother, there wasn't much left before he was going to burn through his reserves, as his chakra levels dropped even further and he felt the cold burn in his feet. It was annoying that Kakeru was using his voice to create illusions. Genjutsu based on long, range sound. It was now a fight for endurance. How long would Kakeru attempt to divert his attention from the number of illusions Kakashi could afford to destroy with the Sharingan in an attempt to murder him? The odds didn't sit well with him. No more ninjutsu. In order to keep eye contact, he had to use his ninjutsu, 13 kanai, 15 shuriken, and smoke bombs, all of which he couldn't afford. One more. You're not. How did you recognize it? Kakashi used another chakra burst to dispel it, then unsheathed his ninjutsu and stalked closer to the target. A short step and a. He was quick. Damn it. Blood trickled from Kakashi's blade as he bared his teeth. Kakeru's cheek had been scratched by him. Steel ringing on steel, they circled one another for a long moment before clashing once more. With a swift turn, Kakashi launched his final kanai into the air, which Kakeru easily avoided. I didn't think Konoha's Anbu were such disappointing fighters, he said with a savage smile, his filed teeth shining in the moonlight. Ignoring him, Kakashi charged forward, slamming him back with a frenzied barrage of blows and landing squarely in Genma's eager embrace. How did? With a grunt, Genma took a kanai from his arm and placed it against Kakeru's neck. Darkly, Hound never misses, he uttered. With a thin sheen of sweat soaking his grimy bandages, Kakashi could see the missing. Nin's throat's throbbing artery pulse. As the world crumpled and darkened, he closed Obito's eye and reeled backwards a little unsteadily, ignoring the dizzying rush of pain. In his mind, Chakra hummed like enraged fire sparks that exploded. Kill him, he said in a raspy voice. Glad. Kakeru grasped Kakashi's wrist after his arm jerked out, it all blew up. Please, Rin cried. Please, Kakashi, you have to kill me. Rin's heart was pulsing and beating in his hands, causing blood to pool and throb. Obito would never forgive him for killing her. Kakashi turned away as father gazed up at him with his dark, lifeless eyes, calling him a traitor, a disgrace, and a letdown to the village. He said, I hate you, and father collapsed on the ground, blood dripping from Kakashi's hands and Tonto deep in his stomach. By Kakashi's hand, dead. He killed his father a dead, deada. Promise me, Kakashi, Obito said, half smiling as he looked up at him, the other half hidden beneath two tons of debris. Assure me that you will safeguard Rin and the village. Kakashi nodded, then used Obito's eye to punch his clenched fist through Rin's chest. Since Naruto was the sensei's child, it goes without saying that he would take care of him. You'll take care of Naruto, right, Kakashi.kun. The entire village shunned and detested sensei's son, Kashina. San's son, and little Naruto after Kakashi nodded and made a vow before throwing him away. Kakashi went and cut the throats of three women, two girls, children, a toddler boy, and a very frail baby who smelled of milk and powder. You. You cannot harm. The children. He said. In order to have their eyes pecked out by crows and their icy little bodies hung on a stone wall, he killed them and then sealed them away in scrolls. Looking down at his bloody red hands, which were so bright and slippery, Kakashi could smell death seeping from every pore on his skin. A tool, a killing machine, who had murdered all of his friends and allowed them to perish, and a 
Kakashi stiffened as a steady hand clamped down on his shoulder and drew him in. A voice called out, come here, and Kakashi heeded it mindlessly. Open your eyes. He didn't realize they were closed until he touched his face, he opened his right side and covered his left with hesitant fingers. The other one, too. Kakashi blinked as a soft hand removed his hand from his face. The memorial was in front of him, he touched his face and blinked once more. No scar, no mask, and no. Obito's eye, he suddenly inhaled. Kakashi turned abruptly to face the voice and stumbled back, confused. Well, it's not exactly ours is it? He asked. This was not a reflection. Rather, it was a figure on a flat surface, and his every action was replicated. To a certain extent, that was him. A copy, a messy one with long hair, crow's feet, and a flak vest. Yo, said Hitaki Kakashi. Seeking the shaky connection between himself and the clone, Kakashi flared his chakra and shaped trembling fingers into a seal. One did not exist. Disperse, his growl said. Unfortunately, the clone didn't. That's kind of rude, the other Kakashi slouched and shoved his hands into his pockets in a reprimand. Kakashi flared his chakra once more and asked, is this? Some kind of genjutsu, but he was unable to sense the confusion in his chakra flow. He squeezed the web between his thumb and finger, but neither the memorial nor the clone dot not. Clone moved. Well, said Kakashi the other, I think it started out as one. With his hackles up, Kakashi snarled, Kakeru, recalling Rin and Obito and Sensei and. The other Kakashi said, yes, Kakeru, with a smile. Well, when I thought I died, I thought I was going to see Rin and Obito and everyone. Is this supposed to be hell? What? The other Kakashi thought. Hell. Maybe it is, as he thoughtfully rubbed his chin. I always did hate myself the most. Maybe I'm condemned to spend the rest of my afterlife with myself. Without the mask, Kakashi's scents were stronger and more distinct, and the other person smelled both right and wrong. Both like and dislike him. And depressing. At least that was recognizable. With caution, he asked, shifting his weight to assume a taijutsu stance, Who are you? I'm you, said the other. I thought that was kind of obvious. Kakashi shifted his focus and narrowed his eyes. How old are you? He inquired cautiously. Ah, the other appeared somewhat uneasy and hunched over. Kakashi scornfully observed all the signs the other was giving off. Well, I, 30. Kakashi shuddered. 30. He blurted out, I live to be 30? Well, yes, replied the other. But just barely. Sort of. I don't know. Maybe I'm the one in a genjutsu? Kakashi remarked, you don't sound convinced, and then he leaned back on a tree that had conveniently and unexpectedly materialized just when he felt it would be pleasant to do so. He took a moment to examine it suspiciously. Well, the other said with embarrassment, his cheeks slightly flushed. My last memories are of me stupidly sacrificing my life for someone else's in a great and tragic battle. With fatigue, Kakashi said, Anbu, right? Not bad but he couldn't bear the thought of ten more assassinations before he choked himself. Anbu until he died. No, the other muttered. It's complicated, but the village is attacked and threatens the safety of one of, of my teammates. So I save him. Not Anbu. Not Raida, Tenzo, or Genma. I quit, declared the other. A long, long time ago. Quit, repeated Kakashi. He could hardly imagine life without Anbu. Life away from the special housing, away from headquarters, away from the never. Ending missions, assassinations, hospital stays, and staring at the water. Damaged tiles. The other rocked back on his heels and asked sharply, how old are you? Twenty, said Kakashi. Ah, the other replied. A long, long silence fell. Finally, unable to take it any longer, Kakashi poked. Ah, this might have been some well. Crafted genjutsu, but the other was too intriguing to ignore. The other declared, I think I'd like to sit, and sank into a cozy armchair. A matching armchair materialized as he waved a hand in front of him. Care to join me? Kakashi shrugged and walked toward the chair, consciously ignoring the tree's disappearance as he did so. The other leaned back in his chair and closed his eyes. So, here's my theory, he said. The scar remained. Unobtrusively touching his own, Kakashi discovered the sharp scar that split his left eye, a tangible reminder of what Dot had. Bin. It was a silent comfort. I know I'm real, relatively sure, anyway, I'm in the middle of fighting pain, or one of pain, or well, actually it's two of him. Things go awfully, I end up being sort of killed with a nail, 
which is very pathetic. I bet Obito is laughing his ass off at that, and then I use Kamui to save the Akamichi boy. I'm dead out of chakra, I know I'm going to die. The other opened his eyes and let them pierce Kakashi's own. You, 20-year-old Anbu Hound Hitaki Kakashi were trapped in a nasty self. Fulfilling Genjutsu while emotionally compromised and mildly chakra exhausted, Kakashi clenched his teeth. Me, 30 years old, dying, dead, on the way to death. You, 20 years old, mind extremely vulnerable. Kakashi objected, this doesn't make any sense, as he struggled to comprehend the other's horrifyingly twisted reasoning. What kind of genjutsu makes up a me that doesn't even look like me and then have him talk about? I don't even know what he's talking about. Is this supposed to make me insane? Hitaki Kakashi turned to face him. What if I told you that I developed Mangekyu enough so that I could use it to transport objects through space and time and other dimensions? And that it was the last thing I did before dying? Instinctively, Kakashi touched his left eye, but all he felt was the rough scar. This doesn't make any sense, he repeated in a very quiet voice. The other concurred, saying, like the science fiction manga Kashina.san hid under the bed, because if we didn't know any better, we could theoretically be talking about time travel here. Fuck, said Kakashi bitterly. A halting? Let's say I believe you, Kakashi said. And that this isn't some kind of crazed figment of my imagination. Well, that's entirely possible. Maybe we're figments of each other's imaginations, the other chuckled. You talk too much, yelled Kakashi. The other shot back, and you don't talk nearly enough, that is. Kakashi closed his eyes, counted to ten, and tried not to think about squelching his obnoxious, older, and possibly hallucinogenic future self. Just. Shut up. Let me think. Thankfully, the other said nothing. Suffice it to say, what's, it like, being, thirty, Kakashi uttered, after. After Anbu. After now. I quit Anbu at twenty, explained the other. Now? Kakashi snapped, clutching the armrest. The other shrugged and said, sort of. Kakeru was involved then too. The genjutsu was nasty, I was wrung out from the mission and I'd been running a string of them because. Because Obito died that month, spoke Kakashi again, quietly. Yes, said the other, quietly. With a sharp, bitter smile, he said, you know how it is. Nearly got the team killed and scarred our little Kohai Tenzo for life. Ended up in the hospital for weeks and by the time psych evals were over, they asked me if I wanted to do another one of those. I didn't. So I quit. Kakashi reiterated, quit Anbu, gently nudging the idea with a careful consideration. I know, the other said with a grimace and a rueful face rub. It was hard and awful and for a while I almost re-enlisted. But, asked Kakashi, painfully, the other signed. The other shrugged and said, then Guy decided that I was his hip cool rival and after that, Guy, Kakashi thought. That weird, taijutsu. Obsessed Chunin who wept a lot couldn't be him, could it? Or shed tears of masculine happiness, whatever. The other replied, yeah, that's him. Kakashi looked at him. Yeah, well, don't judge me, the other said, folding his arms across his chest. I didn't say it was the greatest experience of my life. Kakashi hesitantly asked, that's it? It seemed like a brief and unsatisfying life. You became friends with Guy and then you died? No, said the other slowly, I got, a pack. Kakashi said, pack's dead, and as he held onto the armchair, it creaked, when he said, they're dead. New pack, said the other softly, sort of. I got a genin team you know and they, they changed my life. Desperately, Kakashi repeated, but they're dead, leaning forward, he glanced up at himself and up at Hitaki Kakashi. Rin and Obito and Sensei and father, they're. The other said, pack grows and changes, and leaned forward until their noses were touching and their breaths mixed, and I failed them. Kakashi let out a whine, not again, he said in a raspy whisper. The other said, again, and when he blinked, his eyes became watery and bright, and oh, the other was crying. Dead, traitor, ignored. Threw them away like trash. Couldn't teach them right, didn't teach them, failed my pack. Living with only Obito's eye, Rin's passing, and Sensei's disdained legacy was unthinkable for Kakashi. More, he thought. More failures, more pack. Another ten years. And now you're dead, the other said sourly, and now I'm dead, and he turned away, retreating within himself. The phony joy that had been present earlier vanished, and Kakashi found himself curled up in front of him, exhausted and broken. Kakashi asked hesitantly, what was it like, having, have a pack? Hitaki Kakashi remarked, you know, I taught Uzumaki Naruto. 
Sensei and Kashina. San Sun. Haruno Sakura, civilian girl. Uchiha Sasuke, Obito's nephew. My pet, Kakashi thought. Oh, saying, they were mine, you know, was Hitaki Kakashi. Mine, he said, gritting his teeth and looking directly down at twenty. Year. Old Kakashi, who was only interested in the next mission and the ghosts that prowled the memorial stone. Down at Kakashi without a pack. And after being intimidated, twenty. Year. Old Kakashi had a wild, dangerous idea. Kakashi uttered, Your pack and my pack, are packed. I guess so, Hitaki Kakashi said, thinning his lips in suspicion. But they're also. They're also dead. Our pack is dead, will be. But they're not now, are they? Kakashi remarked, They're still alive. Well, yes, here with you but. Kakashi chose to take a chance and sprang forward. He took the wrist of the other man. He questioned, Do you trust me? Do I trust myself? Hitaki asked, raising an eyebrow. Strangely, I do. With his heart pounding, Kakashi placed his thumb over the other man's pulse and said, Assure me that you'll look after them. Take care of the pack. I don't understand. Promise me, Kakashi uttered angrily while applying a firm thumb press. Promise me that you'll take care of them. That you won't fail them. Not this time. The words, I, were swallowed, I promise. Okay, Kakashi said, letting go and releasing his hold. You promised. He inhaled deeply, willed a tanto to materialize, and the unexpected flash of his father's blade in his hands a whole and undamaged it solidified his decision. Hitaki's expression changed to one of comprehension. No. This is my choice, stated Kakashi, and you promised, don't break it. Hitaki pondered, her face white, but father, he, why are you even doing this? There's no honor or anything, I don't understand, she said. Because Pak, said Kakashi plainly, and all the others who will become Pak, take care of them for me and Tenzo too. But, take care of them, Kakashi suggested. I will. I will, of course I will but, for some odd reason, the Tonto didn't hurt when it slid into the belly. He moved it from left to right while gripping the handle tightly, slick as if it were made of his blood, and felt no pain at all, only a warmth that filled him. Take care of them, he said, and gasped. Or else. His own dark eyes gazed at him as a cool hand cupped his cheek. Thank you. Don't. B. Kakashi forced a feeble smile. This is me being selfish after all. Second. Chance. Kakashi Hitaki withdrew. He vowed, I'll live extra long for you. He whispered, don't fuck it up, and shut his eyes. Secure. The smell of rain and rotting leaves, the strong and recognizable scent of fire country during the monsoon season, filled the air. Kakashi shifted slightly, feeling the mud seeping into his sandals as the catch of his armor rubbed against his skin. Unbound. He checked his chakra levels tentatively, finding them to be low but gradually rising. Not as wide as he remembered, either. The chakra reserves within him resembled a pool more than the deep well that once existed. The foolish child actually succeeded, he did it. Kakashi's eyes snapped open. Captain, Tenzo said, his face close enough to fill his field of vision but far enough away that Kakashi couldn't grab hold of him and choke him. Hot steel knives were frantically piercing Obito's eye, causing pain to stab him in the head. He disregarded it. Pain indicated that he was still alive and that this was not a delusional state. He croaked, water, and fought to sit up, giving Tenzo a sour look when he tried to help him. Kakashi muttered, not dead, and contented himself with resting his back on a thick tree root while letting the oil cloth slide down. With clumsy fingers, he grabbed at it and pulled it back up, covering his ankle. It was throbbing violently and threatened to rain in a short while. He took a whiff of the air. More like fifteen minutes. Tenzo silently handed Kakashi the canteen with ill grace, and Kakashi swished his mouth in acceptance. The water tasted good and was cold. Drinking for the first time in his new life. Sidrep, he uttered, displacing his thick tongue. Secondary targets were eliminated a few minutes after you went down, sir. Tiger sealed their scrolls and Wolf eliminated the witnesses with a poison gas. After the objectives were accomplished, Tiger took temporary command and we returned to our secondary rendezvous point, Tenzo said, his voice muffled by the mask that was wearing. Now the white porcelain was dirty, splattered with mud and dried blood. Tiger and Wolf have set up a perimeter and will return within a few minutes. He had forgotten how young Tenzo was, Shodai's balls. The little figure kneeling beside him, hands clenched on his thighs, caught Kakashi's attention, and he squinted. Kakashi thought, probably still a rookie. Had he yet to break his voice? After lengthy silence, 
he suddenly realized that he was meant to speak. Good, he said. The containment scrolls? In your pack. Wolf also sealed the Kakeru brothers for T and I, sir. Even in death, it appeared that Kakeru would bring him good fortune. With a grim smile, Kakashi took a sip from the canteen while observing Tenzu's covert retreat. Kakashi thought kindly of the good kid. Pak's chest tightened as the unexpected thought struck. How long was I out? He inquired, attempting to dispel the sensation. Tenzo paused before adding, somewhat hesitantly, Wolf isn't very happy about that. Sir. Only about half an hour, sir. Genma complained, I've only dragged his sorry ass around for a hundred times, and silently fell from a branch. Mama Genma was worried sick about you, Captain, Raida added merrily as he made his way through the tree roots in a big, dark shadow. Should have seen him fret about you, poor man. That was a nasty genjutsu, Genma said with a shrug. Knocked you clean of your feet, Captain. I almost thought Kakeru had really got you there but of course, you're too hard, headed for that, sir. It was, Kakashi concurred, and he secretly believed that his Genma the older Genma was far more sensible. His fingers moved slowly and awkwardly as he put down the canteen. All clear? The answer was, all clear, Rita said. Wires and notes and all the necessary goodies to keep our convalescing captain safe and happy. With them, reverting to the old, comfortable pattern was surprisingly simple. It was nice to see them alive, reasonably sane, and without the unsightly scar on Rita's face, even though he had never really left Anbu and no one did. Mission's voice, which sounded suspiciously like the younger version of him, nudged him from the back of his mind. Gathering some strength, Kakashi dug into a hip pouch and pulled out a summoning scroll. With a clumsy motion, he bit down hard on his thumb and swiped it down the unfolding scroll, leaving jagged blood streaks across the kanji. A noticeable weight fell on his lap, and a puff of smoke filled his face. Kakashi croaked, get off me, bull, and pushed futilely at the warm lump. Bull snuffed at his fingers for treats, ignoring him and kissing him sloppily. He crooked a finger at Tenzo and said, not right now, as softly as he could. Scrolls. A moment later, Tenzo reappeared, holding Kakashi's pack carefully in both hands as she vanished into the forest. Resuming his vigilant stance at Kakashi's side, he placed it down by his legs. Digging through the pack, Kakashi noticed that Kid was becoming as bad as Pakun. Bull's salivating mouth was crammed with four scrolls that smelled of blood and chakra. Send that over to the outpost near Grass's border, strictly for Gecko's eyes only. Bull gave Kakashi a tender handshake before vanishing with a burst of reddened chakra. Kakashi rolled up the scroll slowly and said, We'll move out in an hour. Get some rest while you can. With a mutinous expression on his face, Genma opened his mouth, but Raida's hand stopped him by firmly clamping down on his shoulder. Genma shrugged casually, As long as I don't have to carry you again, sir. But Kakashi could hear the hint of worry. Don't worry, Kakashi said with a smile, taking pleasure in the blanching of Genma and Raida's faces. You won't have to again. Pack. Naruto Uzumaki. Sakura Horno. Sasuke Uchiha. Kakashi's sharp canines worried the wood as he absently bit down on the pencil's end. Naruto was the hardest and easiest of the three. His face was an open book, making him the easiest to please. Kakashi pointed out dryly that he had an organization of S-Class missing Nin who were committed to tracking him down and killing him. Sakura was a bit more difficult. A civilian from a respectable household. Even after meeting Ino, she still felt lonely believed that a good civilian girl should be quiet, modest, and attractive. However, she was also the most intelligent of his three students, and when he saw her, he was reminded of Obito, who was desperate to blend in and be accepted. An astute civilian outsider who yearned for acceptance. Sasuke was erratic, self-centered, and incredibly lonely, his only motivations were his love and hate for his brother. Kakashi tasted the lead filling and bit into his pencil, grunting. Sasuke was not the only person ruined by the Uchiha massacre. His team had been torn apart by it. Kakashi frowned. Too many risks, too many variables. However, he had made a self. Promised to protect them, and he would. Regardless. He set down the pencil and picked up a new sheet of rice paper and an ink brush at his side. Hitaki Kakashi formally asks the Sandame Hokage for a meeting. Kakashi felt much more like himself when he was wearing his standard issue navy blue uniform and a musty old vest he had dug out of the back of his closet. Where was Icha Icha when he needed it? He repositioned his mask and absently patted a pocket. Oh. Naturally. Only after leaving the military and when younger Kakashi was still serving as an Anbu hound did he begin reading it. Hitaki.san. 
Kakashi glanced up at the Chunin behind the desk and blinked. You may enter now. He nodded to the man before emerging from the shadows and subtly pointing to the Anbu concealed behind the desk. Safe watch. Kakashi entered the office of the nation's most powerful man as the doors opened in front of him. Sandane. Sama called out, Hitaki.kun, as he calmly smoked his pipe behind his desk. How odd to see the Hokage's pipe at his mouth and the familiar smoke wreath his hat. It's very good to see you. It's even stranger to consider that Tsunade wasn't sitting there, smashing sake bottles and yelling commands at him. Hokage. Sama, Kakashi said lowering himself into the traditional crouch and making the appropriate salute with his fist over his heart. I've come to beg forgiveness for my actions. Forgiveness? The Sandame asked, raising an eyebrow in his voice, what for? Kakashi ignored the gentle flutters of chakra surrounding him and said, I've come to tender my resignation from Anbu, effective immediately, while gazing down at an intriguingly shaped knot on the floor. It resembled Pakun's nose somewhat. Before he left the office, word would undoubtedly spread about his resignation. That is a terrible example of a NBU's nosiness. After an extended period of silence, his ankle began to mutter protests. Sandame finally said, I see, and Kakashi ventured a quick look up. The Hokage's brow furrowed as he sucked thoughtfully on his pipe. How have you come to this decision, Hitaki.kun? I, paused Kakashi, I joined when Minato. Sensei gave up his life to protect the village, he whispered quietly. Kakashi paused once more and, Happily, the Hokage said nothing, understanding that he needed time to gather his thoughts. That was six years ago, Hokage, Sama, I have come to realize that my duty now lies not to the protection of the village in service to the core but somewhere else. Hokage. Sama tapped ashes from his pipe and asked, and what might that be, continued to cling. To Sensei's legacy. Kakashi would accept every card he could get, but he felt he was going a bit too far in reminding the Hokage that the Yandaimi was also his teacher. Sandame. Sama, putting down his pipe and steepling his old, wrinkled fingers, asked gravely, Do you know what you're asking, Hitaki.kun? Never in his life had he been more certain. Yes, Kakashi replied, daring to raise his head and meet the older man's eyes directly. His eyes were dark black and aged, having seen more than he and his younger self combined. A village rose to prominence and ruled twice, more than any other cage in the hidden village's history. Somber, unbreakable eyes that suggested a power capable of bringing down mountains and tenderly guiding a small child. The sight of those eyes made him feel very, very young all at once. He said, yes, Hokage. Sama, once more. After taking a deep breath, Sandame. Sama's eyes change. Then that's settled. We'll discuss the matter later in more detail, Kakashi.kun. The Hokage gave Kakashi permission to use his given name, so he didn't miss it, his chakra flickered excitedly but he kept the joy hidden from his face. When Kakashi said, I am humbled by your generosity, he meant it. I trust you'll stay on until a replacement for your team has been picked? Kakashi reassured him, already taken care of, as he absently wondered what Genma would think of getting promoted and having another notorious genius on his staff. Tenzo flatly stated, you're lying, without even raising his head from his whetstone. Captain would never do that, not without telling us. I'm telling you, I heard this straight from the Nara with the grasshopper mask, straight off of guard duty, Genma remarked as he fumbled with his leg wrappings. Raida said in a casual manner, Nara Shikado needs to learn to keep his mouth shut, while holding his chest plate up to the light with one hand. He whispered, cracked, again, as he narrowed his eyes due to the intense fluorescent light. If you didn't go about charging at every enemy nin like an idiot, you wouldn't be going through so many, Genma remarked, tearing tape off with his teeth. So, what do you think? Raida said, I think it's a sack of shit, and then he let his armor fall thumpily onto the work table. The only person more devoted to the core is the commander and we all know that captain's next in line for that anyway. ANB use his life. Tenzo said, he's our captain, as though that clarified everything, regardless of whether Nara had sworn up, down, and sideways that the rumor was true, Genma had to concede that it did sound ridiculous. They were referring to Hitaki Kakashi here. The only veterans who had served longer than him were the commander and a handful of them. It would be like the sky turning green or the Uchiha suddenly becoming pleasant if the captain quit. Not possible. Before the subject of their conversation sailed into the room, scroll in hand, the three were given a brief knock on the door, yo, he said. Captain. Tenzo shouted at him. Genma scoffed at Raida. Hey? Senbon nearly fell out of his mouth as he mouthed it. In response, Raida shrugged, appearing equally perplexed. 
Hitaki Kakashi, congratulations, Genma, he said, you've just been promoted to captain of Delta Squad. The Senban actually dropped from his lips this time. Uchiha Itachi was given a skewer by Hitaki Kakashi, son of the White Fang, former Anbu Hound, and pupil of the late Yandaimi Hokage. Dango? He asked. Itachi took it with slight, rough hands and said, thank you, politely. So, I've been thinking, Kakashi said hazily, pointing with a used skewer at the surroundings. In his hands, the small piece of wood appeared positively deadly. Would you like to join a top secret organization of ninja dedicated to keeping the peace for Konoha and get a cool tattoo? Itachi thought about the offer as he chewed on his candy, his words, this is very sudden. Kakashi answered, yeah, while spinning the skewer in his palms. Itachi sipped his tea calmly while some of the nearby shinobi gave him a nervous look. But I figured, you know, you're young, talented and probably dying for a chance to really challenge yourself. Not really, said Itachi. Would you do it if I asked you to join only because I want to annoy my old teammates? Itachi's brow puckered as if he thought about the idea for a moment, no. As though they were merely talking about the weather, Kakashi said casually, refusing my offer as a subtle act of rebellion against your clan elders isn't very smart. He lifted the smoking teapot to the side and said, tea? Itachi said, I don't understand, and he picked up his cup, lowering his gaze to accept a refill. Why are you doing this, Hitaki.san? With his chin resting on a hand, Kakashi abruptly inquired, did you know your uncle? No, Itachi replied, as if the non sequitur had not disturbed him. He passed away shortly before my time, during the Third Shinobi War. Kakashi quietly said, Uchiha Obito, and set down the skewer. He tapped at his forehead protector, slanted to cover his left eye, and said, was my teammate. And he asked me to protect the village, to protect the team, and to help me, he gave me a gift. I need your help to protect the village, Uchiha.kun. But, impatiently, Kakashi interrupted Itachi for the first time during their conversation. As his voice grew softer, Kakashi tapped his forehead protector once more, this time on the engraved insignia. I know about your damned clan politics, Itachi. And I know that things are damned complicated right now and that they're dragging you into the bloody mess, hoping you'll be able to fix it, one way or another. The clan is the village and the village is the clan. Protect Konoha and protect the Uchiha, even if it means from themselves. Joining the core will help you, if you do it on your own terms. Itachi looked at him thoughtfully for a long moment, and Kakashi could almost see a glimmer of red in his dark black eyes. You are very informed, asserted Itachi. It's my job to be, Kakashi gave a somber statement. Things are coming to a head. Uchiha.kun. The core is being poisoned from the inside and there are rumors that the Uchiha are unhappy. Konoha will tear itself apart if everything comes to a head and it's my job to ensure that doesn't happen. Itachi sipped his lukewarm tea and asked delicately, the core? According to Kakashi, it's very much tied with clan politics, the words, other than that, I can't say much, hung heavy in the air, but they were unsaid. Itachi tapped absently on his teacup and remarked, my father would be pleased with my acceptance. Kakashi heard the gentle clink of a nail on porcelain resolve into a message, I accept. Kakashi said, I'm sure he would be, feeling intensely relieved that his gamble had paid off. Beneath his mask was a savage smile. Danzo needed to be careful. Captain. Kakashi gently corrected Tenzo, moving across the bed to create space. Not your captain anymore, he said. Along with Sensei's kanai, father's tanto, and Obito's goggles, his armor and ninjutu were carefully packed into a trunk along with his sealed and packed kanai. He was still dealing with the wall hangings Kashina.san had given him, the linen, and. Is there something wrong? Kakashi inquired casually while keeping a close eye on Tenzu's chakra. Cap. Hitaki. Tenzo uttered a sort of stutter. He uttered the words, I don't know what you are anymore, dejectedly. He said, Hitaki Kakashi, and Tenzo saw the comforting pad come as he carefully telegraphed his move, and your friend. But you're leaving. Kakashi said, no one ever really leaves Anbu, and gave Tenzo a clumsy shoulder rub. He had forgotten Tenzu's youth by the Shodai. 15 or 16. He had forgotten how cautious Tenzo had been as a child, and he was uneasy in his own skin and suspicious of the outside world. How Orochimaru had left him in an unfamiliar world after instilling fear and uncertainty in his heart. He made a vow, I'll still be around, while harboring a secret desire to kill Orochimaru. I'm just moving down to the apartment complex a few blocks over, you know, in the subsidized housing area in the Bunkyo ward. You're welcome to visit anytime you'd like, said the man. Tenzo hunched her shoulders and said, 
Thank you, in an awkward manner. Ha. Huh. Hitaki. San. Senpei, said Kakashi. You're still my kohai, aren't you, rookie? Tenzo gave him a shaky smile and Kakashi had an epiphany. Of course, Kakashi. Senpei. Tenzo, he uttered softly. The boy's chakra wavered as he asked, Have you noticed them? Kakashi remarked, So you have, then, with a hint of pride. They. They remind me of some of the others. The others that he worked on, Tenzo said, her face as white as a ghost, and her voice was very quiet. Yes, said Kakashi glumly. They do seem strange, don't they? Always conveniently there to replace a fallen member, and each one of them has been nominated by Shimura Danzo for acceptance into the service. If it was possible, Tenzu's face became even more white, you don't mean. According to Kakashi, Anbu is changing, and not for the better. Keep an eye out for me, Tenzo. Of course, sir, Tenzo deferentially replied. A beat later, he added, Kakashi. Senpei, and Kakashi felt tempted to tousel the boy's hair. The voice whispered in the back of his mind, Pack. Keep the pack safe. Anbu guards will be assigned to watch him during your absences. I trust you've drawn up the appropriate seals for the apartment? Taking a packet out of his flak vest, Kakashi gave it to the Hokage. He apologized and resisted the urge to kick the floor like a genin. It's not the best I can do, but given the time frame and materials, I could only come up with so much, he said. He hurriedly added, I'll do much better with more time and a better sense of Uzumaki, as he observed the Hokage's voluptuous eyebrows gradually lifting toward his vanishing hairline. The Sandame remarked, this is very impressive work, as he traced the kanji with deft fingers. It's adequate, shrugged Kakashi. He could now properly honor those security seals if he had the time, chakra, blood ink, and some of Minato. Sensei's books. In addition to an intriguing one that electrocuted at the wrong touch, he had one in mind that would cauterize shut any intruder's chakra coils. The Hokage said, more than adequate, and gave Kakashi the packet pack. The funds will be wired to your account on a monthly basis and you are given a two-month leave from the active duty roster to adjust to your new role. Kakashi nodded in agreement. Anything else, Hokage? Sama? The Hokage remarked, this is very sudden of you, Kakashi.kun, as he folded his hands and placed them in his lap. Kakashi blinked. Sir, you've served me very well as a shinobi, Kakashi.kun, as a junin of Konoha and as an Anbu operative but never before now have you showed any interest in Naruto.kun. Kakashi thought about his options, and his chest constricted. 20. Year. Old Kakashi threw himself into every mission that came his way, completely content to ignore the face of his deceased sensei come back to life. It is understandable why the Hokage found his behavior odd. To his younger self, it was. He could tell a falsehood, concoct a story about how he had become friends with Naruto, or mutter something about forgiving others and recalling the past. Or he might be honest. Minato. Sensei was. Kakashi started out slowly before pausing, overcome by doubt. He tried to find the right words to describe how Minato had taken Kakashi in, kept him alive, and given him a purpose. After. After father passed, he became. He thought about saying, family, but that wasn't quite correct either because it didn't explain how Minato. Sensei had taught him how to kill a man to defend the village and to protect himself. How Kakashi had chosen Minato. Sensei and how Kakashi had chosen him were not explained. Kakashi could smell the grief on him, as fresh as it was six years ago in the wake of Kayubi's attack, and Sandane. Sama knew where this was going. Since all of his pack members were dead, Kakashi had nothing left to live for and no pack to defend. Minato. Sensei was gone and that meant everyone was gone. I was selfish and I didn't want to think about Naruto, about Sensei's son. I couldn't bear to look at him and see everyone I'd lost, Kakashi said quietly, her regret showing. I joined Anbu and for six very long years, I did the best I could. To forget. To protect the village, like Sensei and Obito wanted me to. Sandame. Sama gave a nod. Silently, I understand, Kakashi.kun, he said. Kakashi gave a headshake. There was more to say, and hearing it out loud, with the Hokage listening and comprehending, was oddly therapeutic. The last mission was. Difficult, he stated. He looked down at his gloved hands, unable to bear to look at the Hokage. I should have refused the mission, if only for the safety of my team, but I went and tried to complete it, only to be caught in a genjutsu. It was careless of me. He said, I was very tired and emotionally compromised. It was a very good one, he uttered without comment. The more experienced the shinobi, the better the illusion. It brought all the worst fear and terrors out of the mind and made them real. 
It was only due to the skill of my team that I woke up with my mind intact. Kakashi absently rubbed his glove's armored plate. I saw Naruto in there, abandoned and alone. Minato. Sensei was Pack and Naruto is his son. Naruto's Pack, he stated. I have a duty to him. Silently, the Hokage remarked, he would be very proud of you. Even though Kakashi was a seasoned junin and 30 years old, he clung to words like a child would to a blanket. Thank you, sir, he said, his voice barely thickening. The Hokage went on, his dark eyes penetrating, you may feel obligated to his father, but my hope is that you will learn to care for him on his own merits. For the first time since entering the sealed room, Kakashi grinned. He reassured him, oh, I don't doubt that, Hokage. Sama, and noted that he would visit Ichiraku later tonight. The matron jerked her head as she said, he's in there, pointing to the closet. Knows he's in trouble so he's gone and disappeared himself, quick. Like. Frogs in the beds, Kakashi surmised based on the high, pitched yelling coming from the adjacent room. The matron sighed and used her apron to wipe her hands. Snakes and spiders, she said. Her voice rose as she said, Uzumaki Naruto, in a firm tone. There's someone here to meet you. Get out of the closet, quickly. Dunwana, Uzumaki, if you don't get out in five seconds. Kakashi grinned and put a hand on her arm. He said sweetly, I'll handle this, Hori.san, and walked amiably toward the door with his hands stuffed in his pockets. He's a stubborn brat, the matron warned him, eyes beadily fixed on him, bad enough that he's the damned. Kakashi's amiable grin became slightly more intense. With a quiet, I believe that's enough, he abruptly made the room's atmosphere much heavier, you may leave now. Whitening her knuckles, the matron swallowed and clutched at her pink apron. She said stiffly, of course, Hitaki.san, and left the room without looking back. Leaning against the closet door, Kakashi watched her leave with caution, making sure her chakra signature left the room. He said, you can come out now, after a long pause, she's gone away to deal with your prank. Kakashi complied by stepping aside as the door cracked open. As he knelt, he saw the faintest glimpse of a blue eye staring up at him. Naruto. His heart was stuck in his throat for a long time, and he was at a loss for words. I sincerely apologize for failing you in the pack, instead, he cleared his throat. Who are you? The boy with the sharp blue eyes behind the door asked impolitely. Kakashi said, Hitaki Kakashi, without thinking, and he was a little puzzled by how high, pitched and squeaky Naruto's voice was. It was familiar in a way that 16, year dot old Naruto wasn't, he had missed watching his student mature and change and his deepened voice had been a bit of an unpleasant surprise when he returned in black and orange. Naruto said, that's a weird name, with suspicion. Kakashi struck back, rocking back on his heels, so's Naruto, he said. In a fit of rage, Naruto pushed open the door, almost cutting Kakashi's nose. Is not, Naruto's the coolest name in the village, he said. Uzumaki Naruto, he bragged, prodding his slender chest with his thumb. Number one prankster. Kakashi said, snakes and spiders, hum, anyone can do that, and he just missed an enthusiastic arm thrashing in his eye. Jiro couldn't and he was the one who dared me because he's a dumb sissy, Naruto exclaimed in his filthy, tattered sandals as he hopped up and down. But I did and it's the greatest bestest prank ever, so there. After saying, I bet you could do better, Kakashi unknowingly reached out and ruffled Naruto's hair. Something warm and soft settled in Kakashi's chest as the boy squawked and pounded at his arm with his tiny hands. After he recovered from the hair, ruffling attack, Naruto looked up with somewhat suspicious eyes and asked, what are you being so nice to me for anyhow, big people are never nice to me. Kakashi secretly made the decision to track down and gradually murder everyone who had mistreated his pupil, he said, well, while idly scratching the back of his head, I'm not a very nice person. Naruto wrinkled his nose and asked, so you ain't being nice? You're so weird. Yeah, concurred Kakashi. What do you say we go have some ramen? With his mouth agape, Naruto gazed up at him. Stars might have started to shine in his eyes. Ramen, he said respectfully, whispering up at the older man. We're gonna eat ramen? Kakashi said, well, if you want to, with a slightly anxious expression. Naruto almost bowled Kakashi over after launching himself at his legs. Yeah, he exclaimed. Ramen, ramen, ramen. After hesitatingly hovering over Naruto's back, Kakashi's hand landed on a bony shoulder and gave it a gentle, if slightly awkward, pat. There's this ramen stand on Main Street that I'll think you'll like, Naruto.kun, it's called Ichiraku and. Kakashi said, 
Don't just stand there like an idiot, with an inquisitive tilt of his head. Tenzo exclaimed, Cap. Kakashi. Senpei. And rocked a little uncomfortably on his feet, which was almost the same as him dramatically clutching his chest. I didn't realize you were standing behind me. A grocery bag swung softly in Kakashi's hand as he shrugged and said, Well, you were looking so intently at the door. Would you like to come in? Tenzo smiled slightly at him. Silently, I'd like that, senpei, he said. When Kakashi casually flicked through a series of hand seals, the door jam briefly glowed a dull blue before returning to its normal brown hue, and he took a step back from the apartment door. Tenzo said, A. Rank security seals, senpei, with sharp dark eyes. Kakashi opened the door and said, I'd like to keep an eye on some important things. His important object, a blur of yellow, orange, and brown fur, collided violently with his knees in a matter of seconds. Naruto yelled, Kakashi. Ni. San, and Ryu joined in the mayhem by yipsing joyfully, you're home. Kakashi said softly, hello, Naruto.kun, and leaned over to pat Naruto's spiky hair. Ryu's ears perked up as the grocery bag clattered to the floor. He barked with excitement and ran to the bag, saying, food, food, food. Kakashi objected, hey, hey, while Ryu used his big black nose to search through the bag. Tenzo saved their food with a skillful hand, navigating Ryu's writhing body with the ease that came from years of experience. Ryu, no, that's going to be our dinner. Tenzo scratched at the dog's frayed ears and said, Hello, Ryu. Chan, with warmth. Ryu drooled spectacularly all over his kohai's face as he enthusiastically agreed, It's been a while, hasn't it? If you looked at him now, wriggling around like an overgrown puppy, you would hardly believe that he was a fierce hundred, pound ninkin. Naruto looked curiously at Tenzo, bending around Kakashi's legs to look up at the stranger with wide eyes. Hey, hey, Ni.san, who's this? He asked. He yelled, he's a ninja, and grabbed Tenzu's forehead protector. Like you, Kakashi.ni.san. Tenzo looked at Kakashi as his eyes slightly widened. Kakashi gave him a smile in return, a joyful curvature of his eye. Naruto.kun, this is Tenzo, he's a friend of mine. Naruto approached the older boy with his hands clasped behind his back, showing interest. He asked gravely, you're Kakashi.ni, San's friend? Tenzo leaned slightly and said, he's my senpei, bracing his hands on his thighs with the same solemnity. A senpei? Was a senpei? Like a friend, Tenzo thought, his gaze reflective. But also like an older brother, too. Someone who's more experienced and older than you at school or at work. Naruto said, Huh, and then pulled expectantly at Tenzu's trousers. Come on, I'll show you the cool shuriken Ni.san bought me. They're super sharp so we have to extra extra careful but Kakashi.ni said we could train with them and then next year I'm going to go to the academy and become a ninja like you and Ni.san. With a silent chuckle, Kakashi watched as Naruto pulled a rather overwhelmed Tenzo to his room, with Ryu dutifully following the two, tail wagging. The voice in the back of my mind whispered, protect them. You made a promise. This, he felt, was a good beginning. Tenzo cupped his mug of tea and fumbled for the right words. He's. Kakashi gave a nod of approval. He said plainly, he's Naruto, and took a sip of his tea. He reminds me of Uzumaki.san, Tenzo remarked while he was idly stroked the edge of his cup. She was very kind to me when. When Yandaimi. Sama brought me to the hospital. Trying to describe Kashina.san was difficult, intelligent, irate, and incredibly powerful. She was the one who taught him his first seal, a straightforward protective symbol that could be carved into wood, she had also bought him ramen and read him the tale of the gutsy ninja while he was in the hospital. And a lot like her son, Naruto Uzumaki. Tenzo remarked wistfully, Naruto reminds me of her. Tenzu's eyes grew piercing as he gazed up at Kakashi, his gaze never missing a beat, when he smiles. The statement was not a question, you left for him. Kakashi's silence was sufficient response. Tenzo exhaled slowly before covering it with a quick tea sip and a smile. It's good to see you of the armor, said the man. Accepting Tenzu's implicit approval, Kakashi asked languidly, how's Genma doing? Tenzo smiled, terribly well, and Kakashi noticed that Yamato's demon face was still visible in his eyes. The rookie was maturing. He hates it of course, complaining about the paperwork and the responsibility, but he's doing well. The role only gave Genma a little more power to mother the team, which he was already doing. Silently, Kakashi was relieved that Genma didn't have to bother him about chakra fatigue, and the rookie? Tenzo proudly remarked, 
Bugs in his locker, mud on his armor, and fake exploding tags on his kanai. Obviously relieved to no longer be considered a rookie after being made fun of by the other Delta squad members for at least 8 months. I bet he's enjoying that, Kakashi remarked sardonically. He set this genjutsu on Raida.san when we were at the mess hall, made him think he was talking to Kyoko.san, Tenzo said with bright eyes. He leaned back in his chair in satisfaction as the tea sloshed slightly in his cup. He was flirting with a salt shaker, the entire time. Astute, astute Itachi. He's a good boy, stated Kakashi, even if he did beat my record. Loyally, Tenzo remarked, he's not as good as you, of course, that was high praise from a boy who could kill a man with a twig and grow a forest in a matter of minutes, though he's very good on the field. Kakashi put down his tea and remarked, he's very polite, very helpful, while idly checking Naruto's chakra to make sure he was asleep. A good person to have by your side. Tenzo said softly, oh, but his eager expression betrayed his true feelings. I'd noticed that you were the one to nominate him for service. Before he found something else to do, like murdering his whole family, he said, well, I couldn't let someone else come and lead him astray, could I? He needed a challenge and I gave him one. Tenzo remarked reflectively, Itachi had been discussing a new dango establishment that opened in Samiya. Lunch there might be interesting. Kakashi said, yes, I would think so, in agreement. Everything else going smoothly? Commander called a mandatory meeting yesterday. Kakashi folded his arms across his chest and arched an eyebrow, he uttered a mild, oh? According to Tenzo, Councilman Danzo was with him, they wanted to speak about the difficult times and how the village could only be as strong as the shadows that protected it. Typical morale boosting, though Commander didn't look very happy to be there. And right after I've left, Kakashi remarked while resting on his chair's back two legs. So inconsiderate of the man. Tenzo, focusing on the wooden table between them, stated, you and Commander are the only ones he's ever really been scared of. And now that you've left, Commander's tied up with council politics. How many new members? Four. Kakashi hummed indecisively. With ten active operatives and who knew how many more Danzo had smuggled in even more covertly and were in training, that made up roughly a tenth of Anbu overall, based on the personnel files Kakashi had surreptitiously perused after his visit to the Hokage. He couldn't help it if the secret records room was so poorly secured, it practically begged to be opened. Kakashi remarked, and me only gone a week, though he questioned what the spies were thinking of Kakashi's abrupt domestic turn. Danzo was undoubtedly making quick money off of his absence, most likely nothing positive. With a pained sigh, Kakashi picked up his now, tepid cup of tea and quickly sucked it back down. Well, I didn't want to do this, he said. But Danzu's just asking for it, isn't he? Tenzo appeared to have just been cornered by a rabid wolf. I'm very, very glad that I'm not Councilman Danzo right now. Kakashi said, yes, that's probably a good thing, and nodded calmly. Otherwise, I would have to cut your stomach and strangle you with your own intestines. Tenzo suffocated his tea. Naruto declared, math is stupid, before hurling himself spectacularly onto the couch and causing Kakashi's recently purchased copy of Icha Icha Paradise to fall to the ground. Kakashi said, I was reading that, in a gentle tone, how was school today? Naruto pronounced the word, boring, extending it with emotion. I want to go to the academy and learn cool jutsu and stuff, not the stupid boring school with math. Kakashi picked up his book from the floor and asked, how are you going to know how many kanai you have left if you don't know math? He checked reflexively to make sure Naruto hadn't noticed the erotic illustration of Keiko on page 69. With a dismissive, whatever, Naruto squirmed to Kakashi's lap and rested his bony elbows on the older man's thighs, failing to notice the silver. Haired man's stiffening. All we do is sit down and it's stupid, I hate it, said the man. Kakashi said, ah, and perused raising children. A shinobi's guide to rearing, ages 6.12 in his mind. He asked gently, why is it stupid? As he wondered if there was a way to instill the concept of personal space in a child's mind without using anything sharp or pointed. At the age of five, Kakashi was thrown into battle and turned into a genin, where he only touched people to kill them. His own father had hardly ever touched him. He had frequently had to remind himself that hugs and ruffling hair were not ways to intentionally irritate his students, but rather ways to show affection. Something inaudible was muttered by Naruto. Kakashi gave Naruto a gentle head pat, is it Keigo again? With snot dripping from his dirty nose and watery blue eyes, Naruto gazed up at him. He buried his face in Kakashi's flak vest and began to sob deeply. He says I'm a demon monster and a, I'm worse than dirt and an in. I'm going to find Keigo's parents, 
subject them to the most excruciating genjutsu I can think of, and then amputate all of their limbs in front of their son, Kakashi thought in the distance. Next, I'm going to. With his hands gripping Kakashi's shirt sleeve, Naruto cried out, Am I? I done wanna be a monster. Kakashi.ni. I'm not a monster. I done wanna. I I. With a firm. You're not a monster. Kakashi gave Naruto a rough back rub. You're a six-year-old boy who likes ramen and pranking too much to be a monster. Kago's wrong, Naruto.kun, he's wrong. B.U. Why does everyone hate me? Naruto sniffed, spit tears and saliva all over his vest. It was better than blood and urine, Kakashi assumed. That, I can't tell you, Kakashi announced following a protracted pause. It's very complicated and it's something I can only tell you when you're much older. But, I can tell you that not everyone hates you. What about me? And Sandane? Sama? And Tenzo? And Ryu? With hope, Naruto said, Really? You don't? You don't hate me? And he sat up in his lap, bending his neck to look into Kakashi's eyes. Kakashi whispered, I could never hate you, and used the end of his sleeve to dab at Naruto's nose. Naruto said a little bashfully, I don't hate you neither, and then he lunged at Kakashi's neck, squeezing it tightly. Kakashi assumed it was the Sharingan, irritated chakra coils, causing Obito's eyes to begin to leak tears. Even though his normal eye was also crying, he chose to ignore it. Nothing but dust. Irritation of the chakras. His arms wrapped tightly around Naruto's small frame. Hey forehead, what are you reading? Some dumb book again, huh? Gonna be a ninja, dumb forehead girl like you. Sakura tried to hide behind the large book she had borrowed from the library but dust rose in her eyes and she blinked frantically. Look, she's trying to hide her big ugly face behind the book, too bad it's too small to cover it. Sakura grew even smaller and fervently hoped that the ground would split open and engulf her, she had read about a jutsu that could do that, but she lacked the chakra and was unaware of the hand seals. She was just a big, ugly, stupid civilian girl. She squinted her eyes, but the tears still came. Look, look, the dumb girl's crying look at her stupid crying face. More dust flew at her, along with small stones and sticks, some of which were hurled so forcefully that they scraped her cheeks. You can't hide from us, ugly forehead, you big dumb bully. A tiny blonde tornado smashed into Amma's face, fists flying in all directions, as Sakura looked up from behind her book. You shut up about her, Amy stumbled back, causing Miko and Kyoko to fall to the ground as blood gushed from her nose. Miko screamed, my knee, as she clutched pathetically at the small cut on her leg. Sakura thought savagely, good, and lowered her book even further. Amy clutched her nose and screamed, you stupid demon monster, I'm going to tell Papa and he's going to hurt you so bad. Naya Naya Naya. The blonde boy sneered, thrusting his thumbs into his ears and sticking his tongue out. Sakura suppressed a laugh. He chanted, tattletale, tattletale, run away tattletale, while hopping with his feet. Miko and Kyoko jumped up and dutifully followed Amy as she stomped off after giving him one homicidal glance. Up close, Sakura could see that it was Uzumaki Naruto, the class clown and troublemaker from the temple school, as her blonde hero scratched his head sheepishly. You okay? She asked. None of the girls liked him, especially the dim-witted Amy, and he always played alone while making dumb fart jokes. However, he had saved Sakura by calling Amy stupid and punching her in the nose. She put her book down and took a nervous swallow. She mumbled, thank you, and brushed her bangs across her forehead. Hey, hey, I'm Naruto, was your name? Shyly, she said, Sakura, and got to her feet, using a dirty sleeve to wipe the dust from her face. We're in class together at school, she said quietly. With his whiskers all scrunched up, Naruto leaned in and squinted at her, asking, E.H., we are? Yeah, Sakura said with a nod. You got in trouble today for punching Keigo, remember? With his hands at his hips and his chest puffed out, Naruto declared defiantly, Kakashi.ni said if I had a reason then I can punch anyone all the time ever. Really? Naruto lost his confidence. He scratched his head and said, I think so? Kakashi.ni used lots of long words and stuff but he definitely said I could punch him. Sakura offered and sadly prodded at her filthy dress, saying, My mama doesn't like it when I get dirty and fight. Naruto jumped up and down on his feet and exclaimed, but getting dirty and punching is the bestest ever. Hey, 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 you wanna play with me? We have a ninkin back home and lots of cool books and Kakashi.ni got me shuriken and stuff so as I can train and become the Hokage. Sakura asked, her ears perking up, ninkin? 
isn't that like a ninja dog? Naruto smiled and stuffed his hands in his pockets. Yup, he said, wanna come? Sakura thought about the filthy boy in front of her, who had blood on his knuckles, a wide smile, and dirt all over his face. Okay, she said, smiling slightly at him. Sandane. Sama said, this is very sudden, with an unreadable expression on his face. Kakashi gave a shrug. He stood calmly in front of the most powerful man in the five shinobi nations and said, it is my right, Hokage. Sama, without raising an eyebrow. Slowly, of course, Sandane. Sama replied, but there hasn't been one in over 15 years, Kakashi.kun. Kakashi, covertly flipping through the pages of Icha Icha in his hand, asked hazily, well, then I guess it's about time that I've gotten around to the duty, right? Are you sure? This will be quite a surprise to many of the council members. Good to keep people on their toes, Kakashi remarked, raising an eyebrow. With a subtle shift in the craggy lines of his face, Sandane. Sama smiled. Oh, I think I'll very much enjoy having you around, Kakashi.kun. For more than 15 years, the seat between the Uchiha and Hayuga had been vacant, serving as a continual reminder of what happens when one mistake is made. The clan was reduced to a member who refused the title of head, and despite the arrival and departure of council members over the years, the seat remained vacant. With only one ninja remaining in the clan, Fugaku surmised that it would not be long before one of the other clans vying for a seat on the council would take the chair's place. There were also covert running bets on when the chair would vanish. Naturally, it was unexpected when a body puffed into existence and a cloud of smoke abruptly swirled around the Hitaki chair next to him. Before he realized he was staring at the masked face of Hitaki Kakashi, Sharingan activated and Fugaku had a kanai at the intruder's throat. Ignoring the blade at his jugular, the boy said, Yo, with a smile. Sorry I'm late, I had to help an old lady cross the street. Fugaku sheathed his weapon and robotically lowered his arm. The suddenly occupied chair at the table caught the attention of every clan member. Ah, said Sandane. Sama coolly. Hello, Hitaki. Dono. Hitaki Kakashi said, Hokage. Sama, in greeting. Uchiha. Dono, he uttered, gesturing toward Fugaku. He exclaimed, great reflexes, with joy. Fugaku dutifully said, Hitaki Kakashi, and he saw the pale, I jerk, Haishi, instinctively clutch his armrests, his knuckles turning white. Sume growled from the other side of the table, what are you doing here, whelp? Because they believed the Hitaki encroached on their territory and skills, the Inazuka and the Hitaki had a tense relationship. When Hitaki Sakumo had sat on council meetings, his father had told him this over dinner a very long time ago. However, it had lost all significance when Fugaku had assumed the Uchiha seat, Sakumo was long gone, and Kakashi was too young. Apparently, that was going to change. Well, Hitaki muttered as he sat down in the uncomfortable hardwood chair, boneless. What do you think I'm here for? From his seat close to the Hokage at the head of the table, Shikaku said with inquisitive dark eyes, you've had the right to attend council meetings and take upon the duties of clan head since you were 15, but you've never chosen to exercise it before. Well, now that it's declassified, I can safely say that I was serving Anbu at the time and could not properly carry out my duties, Kakashi stated, with a remarkably bored expression on his face. A sliver of orange was visible to Fugaku from the Junin's vest pocket. Aburame said softly, you have no clan to speak of, as his glasses reflected the fluorescent light. You are head of nothing, leader of a family long gone. Kakashi resentfully remarked, now, that is very rude, with his hands clasped together on the table. I'll have you know I've recently adopted a ward. When the power. Hungry warmonger Danzo finally spoke, Fugaku observed with ill. Concealed distaste. The old frog croaked, you have managed to gain custody of the nine tails. He is a weapon, not some orphan you can pick off the streets. Every face in the room, except for Hitaki's and the Hokages, flickered with varying degrees of shock, as Fugaku could see. It's interesting, he thought, and put the idea away for later. Well, for a supposed weapon, He's been treated like shit, Hitaki remarked, resting his head on the chair. The Yandaimi would have wanted the village to protect and care for him, as the hero he rightly is. With his claws tapping on the table marked with years of ink and kanai, Sume growled, what would you know of the Yandaimi's wishes? Fugaku interrupted and then played his first card, saying, Hitaki was the former student of Namikaze Minato, the Yandaimi Hokage. Sume bared her teeth at him and said, Inazuka, dono. Shikaku inserted languidly, the Nine Tails has been present in the village since the Shodai's time, a weapon that all the other hidden villages have feared. 
The only difference is that now the entire village knows about it, instead of just the council. The Yandaimi gave us our greatest gift back to us with the cost of his life. It's only right we should take care of him and treat him not only as a weapon but as the child he is, Kakashi stated. He's six. The room's temperature dropped noticeably, and Fugaku forced himself not to flinch. The bratling next to him was fierce by Shodai's standards. He is a threat to the village, Danzo declared, pounding his cane against the ground. Either he should be eliminated or trained into the tool that he is. The boy is a child and a gift from the Yandaimi, as Shikaku. Dono claims. Shinobi may be tools, Akamichi Shuza growled from his seat, but in Konoha we treat our people with pride and respect. Akamichi nodded his head at the Nara. Fugaku's mouth twisted. The notorious Ino. Shika. Sho alliance was now at play. I accept Hitaki Kakashi's custody of the child. The boy appeared to be intentionally upsetting Danzo, with the trio on his side. Fugaku thought about the cards he was holding. Power was already changing in this room, all around this odd little boy. An old Iron War philosopher once said, the enemy of your enemy is an ally. Fugaku hated Danzo enough to view him as an enemy, constantly minimizing the Uchiha's strength and limiting their freedom of movement. He made the bold decision. As he declared, I move to accept Hitaki Kakashi as head of the Hitaki clan and a formal member of the council, he silently savored the sharp gasps of breath he could hear. As he smoked his pipe, Sandane, Sama said, motion recognized, for the first time, any seconding motions. Nara looked up. I second. Akamichi and Yamanaka also nodded their heads in silent agreement. Haishi cocked his head beside Hitaki. I also second this motion. Five clan heads had agreed to accept both the Hokage and Hitaki's brat. With a sharp eye, Fugaku saw that this was exactly what the Hokage had intended, the clan's alliances were already changing, the traditional ways had vanished, and the room had been shattered to pieces when Kakashi had entered with a beaming smile. Insightful, Fugaku gave in and glanced at Danzo. The elderly Kud appeared extremely unhappy, Fugaku concealed a grin, it would turn out to be a really fascinating month. As everyone left the room, the meeting adjourned, Kakashi leaned idly against the table, he remarked absently, sure pissed off the councilman there. The dry old stick, Fugaku, gave him a homicidal look, in a stiff voice, he stated, the councilman and I are not on the best of terms. Kakashi said, yeah, me neither, and folded his arms across his chest. Still gunning for the top, isn't he? Fugaku scoffed and pushed his chair in, I wouldn't know, he said. Kakashi confidingly leaned in and asked, know what I think? I think he totally has it in for you, terrified of what you might do to him. Fugaku, unconsciously, also drew nearer. Behind his mask, Kakashi concealed a smile. Sinker, line, and hook. With power, comes fear and respect. It's only right that he feels such towards the Uchiha. Kakashi shrugged his shoulders and cryptically stated, Loyalty is the most important thing to Danzo. Loyalty to his Konoha. With red flashing in his eyes, Fugaku stated, the Uchiha are sworn to serve the Hokage and the village through an age.old alliance, we are loyal. Kakashi reassured him, oh, I'm sure you are, using as much fake flattery as he could manage. After all, the village is the clan and the clan is the village. The Uchiha would only hurt themselves by going against Konoha. Of course, Fugaku replied, appearing somewhat unsteady. Kakashi went on, anyway, I wanted to thank you for what you did, with a curving eye. You didn't have to support me in my bid. With a firm voice, Fugaku stated, it was for the benefit of the council. Kakashi deftly lied, I appreciate it all the same, as does the Hokage, he knows what you're trying to do, protecting the village and Naruto and all. Naruto? Kakashi brightened and said, you know, him. My ward. Say, would you like to visit him? You have a son around his age, don't you? Blinking, Fugaku said, I yes. His name's Sasuke. His lips slightly curled up and his face slightly warmed. He'll be attending the academy next year, he declared with pride. The fact that the other man had a heart of some kind surprised Kakashi a little. Great! He exclaimed, getting better fast. I'm sure they'd love to meet. How does next Sunday sound? Your place? Dinner? Fugaku blinked once more. What? Great! Kakashi sealed his hand and allowed Chakra to flow around him, embracing him in a way that was familiar. I'll see you then, Fugaku. Sama. Kakashi leaned back with his hands stuffed firmly in his pocket. He had forgotten how draining it was to engage in conversation while feigning enjoyment. He much preferred using hand signals and holding a menacingly sharp, pointed object. Head of clan. 
He thought about it, rolling the concept around in his mind. Because, well, it had been his father's job, he had never taken the position before, and with the blood of the Third Shinobi War smearing the Hitaki name, there was no point in his death. However, now. For Naruto. For those for whom he gave his life. Within the apartment, there were two chakra presences. Kakashi automatically palmed a kanai and flooded the seal with chakra by pressing a palm against it. Naruto had used the key and placed his hand on the unlocking seal in a normal manner, so they were unaffected. There was no sense of turmoil or anxiety in his chakra. It actually appeared excited. Kakashi scowled as he examined the house's two small fires. The other person's presence was recognizable, and the signature resembled an old favorite shirt that he had misplaced but later discovered in a secret drawer corner. Kakashi's heart caught in his throat as the chakra spiked once more. Sakura. Chest tight, he unlocked the door and reluctantly put his kanai away. He yelled, Naruto, in the hopes that the boy wouldn't notice how his voice wavered, I'm home. The familiar cry, Kakashi. Ni, was heard, and a tangled mass of dog and boy scampered across the hallway, landing squarely on his knees. He caught the two with gentle, hospitable hands after instinctively bracing his feet with chakra. He said, hello, Naruto, and his guard dropped for the first time that day. It's very good to see you. Naruto yelled into his ear, you're back, you're back, while Ryu eagerly licked his other hearing. Kakashi said, I'm here, I'm here, and ruffled Naruto's vivid yellow hair. Something pink appeared around the corner as he looked up, then squeaked out of sight. With Naruto clinging to his leg like a burr, he stood up and walked down the hallway, asking, do you have something to tell me? Oh yeah. Naruto exclaimed, his eyes turning into tiny blue slits as he smiled broadly. I brought a friend over and her name is Sakura and she knows all the coolest things about ninja and we were playing with Ryu and an inn. When Kakashi turned the corner, he saw his young pupil with pink hair sitting courteously at a kitchen chair, her cheeks a deep red. He said, hello, Sakura. Chan, grinning. It's very nice to meet you. Sakura squealed and put her hands over her face, saying, nice to meet you. After entangling himself from Kakashi's leg, Naruto dashed towards Sakura, almost colliding with the chair legs. When Sakura, Chan saw his two young students in front of him, the embarrassed expression changed to one of amazement and he rubbed the back of his neck. Hey, hey, hey Sakura. Chan, this is Kakashi.ni.san, he's the bestest ever in the whole world ever and he's the strongest ninja in the village, said Kakashi. Well, I'm not that great, Naruto.kun. He uttered impassively, would you like to stay for dinner? The twins, Sakura and Naruto, both turned pink and yellow at the same moment. Her face went pale as she said, I'd love to but my mama. Her green eyes welled up with tears, and Naruto turned to face Kakashi, begging, I forgot to tell mama that I came over here to play. Something inside Kakashi gave. He bit his thumb and said, all right, then we'll just have to let her know then, okay? His hands were familiar with handling seals. After slamming his hand to the ground, he saw Pakun's recognizable sullen face as the smoke cleared. Boss, Pakun growled, and Kakashi heard the startled exclamations of Sakura and Naruto. Pakun, Kakashi smiled, pleasure causing his chakra to spike, it's good to see you. The dog muttered, yeah, yeah, and turned to stare suspiciously at Sakura and Naruto. You whelped? You? Kakashi quickly muttered, I'll explain later, and pointed to Naruto. Pencil and paper. Please, Naruto.kun. Naruto ran to the living room desk and returned panting, holding stacks of paper in his hands and a pencil in his mouth. After accepting it with a mumble, thank you, he wrote a brief note to Haruno.san stating that Sakura was playing with Naruto and that he would personally escort her home after dinner. Kakashi rolled it up after signing it with a flourish and a small henahenomoheji. Take this over to Haruno Sakura's mother, Sakura, where do you live? Sakura performed the line. Bunkyo Ward, Cherry Tree Street, number 676, while holding her hands together in her lap. Kakashi said, there, and gave Pakun the paper, straight to Sakura, Chan's mother, you understand? Pakun growled with emotion, you owe me an explanation, and vanished in a cloud of smoke. Naruto exhaled, whoa, his eyes glassy with wonder. That was so cool, Ni. Chan, I want to learn to do that. Sakura whispered, don't be stupid, to him looking equally amazed. That's a summoning technique. Only super advanced ninja know that. I'm not stupid, Naruto bellowed angrily in response. Sakura retorted, stop acting like you are. We'll learn when we become ninja later, when we're older. 
Gazing at his two pupils in front of him, Kakashi grinned and listened to their arguing with a contented expression. Being at home felt good. Naruto said, we look so stupid, in his best attempt to sound like an indoor voice a little less than yelling at other people. The way Kakashi said, we're having dinner with some very nice people, sounded as though he were making his way to his own funeral. He retrieved the dark blue scarf he had wrapped around his neck from the bottom of a box containing all of his old clothing and tugged at it impatiently. How could he have invited himself into enemy territory? Two body bags that were precisely the right size for him and Naruto were carried out of the Uchiha district in Kakashi's vivid fantasies. Naruto complained, shirt itches, and pulled at the hem of the formal white shirt that Kakashi had forced him to wear while threatening to deny him ramen for a month. Kakashi retorted, deal with it, and made an effort to keep his hands off the kanai he had tucked up his sleeves. As they got closer to the gate that led to the district, he straightened his back and reminded himself that there was no permanent damage. He faked a happy smile at the two bored. Looking sentries. Afternoon, he addressed them. Lovely weather isn't it? State your name and business, one of the guards said, glaring at Kakashi's mask, long, sleeved black shirt, and black pants with his dark eyes. Thankfully, Naruto said nothing. Kakashi said, Hitaki Kakashi, here to have dinner with Uchiha Fugaku, and as Naruto appeared to be about to flee back to the village, he grabbed his shoulder in warning. He thought savagely, coward, ignoring his own instinct to flee home. The sentry droning, Fugaku. Sama is expecting you, and Kakashi smiled tightly at him. Of course he is. He led Naruto through the gates and into one of Konoha's most prestigious neighborhoods while holding him in a steel grip. Flames flickering in the evening wind, they were met by a bright red line of swinging lanterns. Kakashi could hear steel ringing and laughter in the distance, he could also make out an okonomiyaki stand bustling with business. Naruto muttered, wow, as he gazed around him in wonder, it's like a whole, another village. This was the Uchiha district as it ought to have been in his own era, Kakashi thought grimly. Teeming with families, children playing carelessly, and life. Given that, at the age of seven, his entire home had been destroyed in a single night, it is understandable why Sasuke had been driven insane. As he spoke, memories of Minato. Sensei's old lectures came flooding back to him. The Niadame granted the Uchiha this land as a gift for their faithful service to the village, Kakashi said. As Naruto trotted to keep up with Kakashi's rapid pace down Main Street and toward the residential area, he pondered, how many people live here? Seeing the curious looks many of the Uchiha gave them, Kakashi distractedly replied, hundreds, and contemplated whether to put the two of them under a genjutsu. He changed his mind after a moment. The more people who saw them enter, the better. Fugaku would have a much harder time killing them. There's the main family, then several branch houses and some of the civilian families with close ties to the Uchiha clan that also live here. With his hand firmly clutching Kakashi's, Naruto questioned, main family and what? As the scenery changed to make room for more trees, ponds, and the occasional house, with roofs flowing gracefully in the sky, the crowded crowds had subsided and the excitement of the shops had vanished. Out of memory, Kakashi followed the route, occasionally glancing at the covert chakra markers positioned along the dirt road sides to ensure they were headed in the correct direction. Big clans, especially those with Keke Jenke, are divided up into several sections, Kakashi absently stated while pulling his forehead protector over Obito's eye. There's the main, important family. They're usually the strongest and hold the most power. The branch ones are not as strong and they don't have as much money or status. Uchiha Fugaku, who we're meeting for dinner, he's the most important person here. He's the head of the main family, which means he's the head of the entire clan. With his nose wrinkled, Naruto questioned, that means he's super powerful? As Fugaku's magnificent and exquisite home gradually came into view, Kakashi hazarded, trying to ignore the way his heart was settling in his stomach. I guess so, he said. But he's not as powerful as you, right Kakashi.ni.san? Startled, Kakashi gazed down at Naruto's vivid blue eyes, which were open, trusting, and exactly like Minato. Senseis, Kakashi finally said, it's hard to say, after a prolonged pause. I haven't fought him before. Don't worry, Ni.san, Naruto said with assurance while clenching his fist. I know you're the bestest ninja in the whole world ever, you can definitely beat Fuguki. Fugaku, Kakashi instinctively corrected, wondering hazily at the warmth rising in his chest. Right, that's what I said. When the path came to an end, Kakashi was standing in front of the stairs that led to the magnificent sliding doors. Twelve years old, miserable, with Obito's eye recently implanted in his head, it appeared much the same as when he had first arrived here. He wondered if the Uchiha clan head would request his death. 
he was here, at least, for much more agreeable reasons this time. Kakashi felt two chakra signatures drift over to the door as soon as he flared his chakra once. Without making a sound, the doors opened to reveal a friendly, looking woman wearing an Itachi and kimono, dressed in a traditional collared shirt and black pants that were once standard issue. Oh, she exclaimed, pressing a hand to her mouth. Please, forgive our manners, we were expecting you much later. Kakashi jabbed his elbow at Naruto. Bo, he growled. Likewise, he bowed and smiled up at Uchiha Makoto. It's a pleasure to meet you, Uchiha.san, said the man. This is my ward, Uzumaki Naruto. Naruto, to his credit, leaned over and only swayed a little. Itachi said softly, it's very good to see you, Hitaki.san, with unreadable dark eyes, and you as well, Uzumaki.kun. Makoto gave Naruto a tentative smile in response to his inquisitive gaze. My son, Itachi, she said, placing a soft hand on her son's waist. Please, come in. Welcome to our home. The two ascended the wooden stairs and entered a tatami. Matted, elegantly furnished anteroom. After removing his sandals and shoving them beneath a bench, Kakashi grabbed a pair of slippers that appeared to fit him. Seeing the pink and white house slippers that Kakashi was wearing, Naruto whispered, we have to change shoes. After searching for a pair in Naruto's size, Kakashi discovered a bright yellow pair bearing the Uchiha crest. Do as I do, Naruto, and we may yet come out of this alive. Take off your sandals and put these on, it's the polite thing to do. Naruto, whose tiny feet were dwarfed by Kakashi's filthy and worn blue sandals, yanked off his beloved ninja sandals with ill grace. He had been so thrilled when Kakashi had given him the pair that he had been rendered speechless. Dinner will take a while, Itachi said, his voice drifting over to the whispering pair on the floor from the hallway that led out of the anteroom. My mother wishes to send her apologies for leaving her guests, but the rice needed tending to right away. With a single fluid motion, Kakashi stood up and tucked a wriggling Naruto under an arm. Oh, not a problem, he said. It's our fault for coming so early. With a smile, Itachi motioned for them to follow. The man led them through a maze of gorgeous hardwood hallways and rice. Paper sliding doors. I have a younger brother about the same age as you, Uzumaki.kun, he said. The graceful simplicity of the lines vaguely reminded Kakashi of the innumerable houses of lords he had killed. His name is Sasuke and he'll be attending the academy next year. The mention of the Konoha Ninja Academy made Naruto tense. Really? Me too? Kakashi.ni.san said I could go next year when I'm seven and I'm super 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 excited to go. Itachi whispered softly, perhaps you'll be classmates, and paused in front of an unmarked rice paper door with two chakra signatures flickering behind it. Father, he uttered, slightly raising his voice. You have guests. Enter. Kakashi held Naruto tightly as he followed Itachi into Uchiha Fugaku's lair. Surprisingly, it was open. At the far end, a whole wall had been pulled out, revealing a courtyard with a well, kept rock garden and lovely plants. With a cup of tea in front of him, the village paper in his hands, and a very bored, looking little Sasuke sitting next to him, Fugaku himself was seated at a low table in the center of the room. Brightly, Kakashi said, Uchiha.san. So good to see you, what a lovely home you have, and set Naruto down next to him, across from Sasuke, on a cushion. As he sat down beside his father, Itachi gave him an unreadable look and said, This is my ward, Uzumaki Naruto. That must be your son, Sasuke, right? Fugaku calmly put down the paper and said, Hitaki.san, with a look that suggested he wanted to give Kakashi the stink eye. How, pleasant to see you. Kakashi remarked amicably, Likewise, likewise, and pondered the duration of this torment. Hello, our amazing host, he nudged. Naruto. Naruto smiled. Fugaku.san, Naruto said after Kakashi gave him a slightly stronger shove. Hiya Fugu. Naruto stumbled a little as he recovered. Nice ta Micha. I'm Uzumaki Naruto, the greatest prankster in the whole widest world and I'm gonna be the Hokage someday, yeah. Naruto appeared to have vomited all over Fugaku's hakama. He dreams big, Kakashi said, smiling and ruffling Naruto's hair while ignoring his humiliating squat. Across the table, Sasuke's plump cheeks scrunched up as he smiled and came to life a bit. It was cute, Kakashi thought, a little disappointed. Kakashi propped his elbow languidly on the table and asked, What about you, Sasuke.kun? You're going to the academy next year, right? Sasuke glanced at his father and then raised his voice. Yes, he said, his squeaky voice swelled with pride. Father said I shall be going when I'm seven years old. 
I'm going to be a ninja and be better than my Aniki someday. Hey hey, I bet my Ni.san is better than your Ni.san, Naruto exclaimed, furiously hitting the table with his fists. Fugaku's gaze wavered. What? Sasuke appeared to have been punched. The little six, year old got to his feet, hands on his hips, cheeks flushed. My Ni.san is the best ninja in the village, so there. Naruto retorted, Kakashi.ni.san is the best in the whole country, and got to his feet. He's the bestest ninja in the world world. No mine is, no mine, no mine to the power of infinity. Kakashi's voice rose as soon as he witnessed Fugaku's temper flare. All right, boys, he said sheepishly, stroking his tangled hair. Itachi looked at him amusedly and said, no need to argue about silly things like that. The boys all screamed, silly, before giving each other equally sour looks. Silly, Itachi said again, his tone firm. Kakashi. Senpei and I are ninja in service to the village. There's no need for comparison. There was no need to argue the point because Kakashi was likely superior to Itachi, as the smug back of his head pointed out. Right and you two will be much better than us in the future, I'm sure, he concluded, pulling Naruto back to the ground. Naruto grunted and said, yeah, whatever, I still think you're better, the tenuous truce that Kakashi and Itachi had created threatened to collapse as Sasuke appeared to be a murderer. Kakashi frantically added, how about we play a game, to the conversation, a cool ninja game that my own sensei taught me when I was your age. Naruto asked, his ears perking up, game, a ninja game? He subtly motioned for Itachi to bring some ink, a brush, and rice paper at this moment. Yes, but only if you and Sasuke play together. Itachi slipped out of the room without a word, leaving the two younger boys in the dark. There was no objection to Fugaku's statement, we will be having dinner soon. Just a little game, said Kakashi with ease as he smashed through Fugaku. After 30 years of ignoring three different Hokages, Kakashi knew that Fugaku was no match for Tsunade's rage, the Sandame's unyielding nature, or the Yandaimi's terrifying skill. Of course, Minato. Sensei had used the exercise to teach him to identify and steer clear of exploding notes in preparation for the Chunin exam, but with a few tweaks. My Junin Sensei taught me this when I was six. Fugaki, in spite of himself, appeared interested. The Hokage didn't say, your Sensei? But Kakashi heard it nonetheless. It helped me pass the Chunin exam, Kakashi admitted honestly. He had eliminated a whole colony of enormous centipedes by taking advantage of the fundamental sealing techniques that Minato. Sensei had taught him. Kakashi said, Ah, oh, thank you. Uchiha.kun, as Itachi abruptly reappeared at his elbow, placing rice paper, a brush, and an inkstone on the table. Sasuke pleaded with his father, Please, father, his eyes widening and becoming adorable. How odd to see something so adorable on the face of his resentful and revenge. Obsessed student. How typical it appeared. How appropriate. Kakashi took a chance and gave Itachi a fleeting glance, erasing the gentle and tender expression on his face. Fugaku gave in and said, all right, but his eyes were hard, but we finish as soon as your mother says dinner is ready. Thank you, father, said Sasuke with a smile. Naruto exclaimed, yeah, thanks Fugaku.san, we're gonna play a ninja game. In order to test the consistency, Kakashi dipped a finger into the murky black water and ground up an ink stick Itachi had so kindly provided. He pushed the chakra out of his finger with a sharp nudge, and the new ink glowed iridescently blue as it thirstily sucked up the chakra he fed it. A few minutes later, he dipped his brush into the chakra. Enhanced ink and allowed the flow to slither to a stop. With sharp dark eyes, Fugaku noted, exploding tags? Absently replying, something like that, Kakashi started drawing six ceiling tags on a piece of paper, ready to blow up when the release kanji was scored. Using swift brush strokes, he completed inscribing the six tags before palming a kanai. Explodes with ink instead of chakra fire. My sensei came up with it to help me understand the principles of exploding notes and sealing techniques. Kakashi cut the sheet into six sections with quick, effortless motions, then put them on the table to dry before beginning another. Silently, Itachi said, this is excellent sealing work, his dark eyes fluttering red. Have you tried modifying it for other uses? It's basic sealing, Kakashi said, nervously painting the release kanji with tiny, deliberate strokes. Sensei came up with all these modifications for the tags. Flares, sensor tags, timed explosions. It's how he managed to work out Hiraishin in the first place. Kakashi nodded, raising Fugaku's eyebrows in question, the flying thunder god technique? Done. 
Kakashi cut the final piece of paper and quickly dried the twelve exploding tags by laying a casual wave of chakra wind over them. Kakashi smiled wolfishly, All right, boys. Want to play a ninja game? He's not what I expected, Fugaku remarked thoughtfully as he sipped his tea. At his side, his son twitched, his eyes effortlessly following the punch that Sasuke bravely attempted to land on Kakashi but instead struck Naruto's shoulder. The screech of pain that followed was so loud that it made Fugaku think of Sasuke's much younger days. Which one? inquired Itachi. Both. He enjoyed the crisp, bitter taste of the green tea as he swirled it around in his mouth. Fugaku hesitated, trying to find the right phrase, then said, the boy is surprisingly normal for, for what he is. If he and Sasuke befriend each other, it would be good for the clan. Itachi's son's normally gentle voice became slightly harder as he asked, why not for Sasuke's benefit, Fugaku scowled. His tone was admonishing. What is good for the clan is undoubtedly good for Sasuke, he stated. As he watched Kakashi effortlessly dance around the exploding notes Sasuke had deftly hidden in the dirt, Naruto came flying out of Makoto's prized rose bushes, scattering pink rose petals everywhere. You must not forget, Itachi, we all of us have a duty to maintain the clan's power and status in the village, as it is right. Uzumaki is now Hitaki's ward, and he's recently claimed his father's seat for his own. Things are changing, Itachi, and the Uchiha must keep up. While Kakashi skillfully sidestepped the boy, Sasuke leapt to his feet and headed directly for Kakashi's knees. Long ago, Senju and Uchiha came together to form the basis of this village. Fugaku set down his teacup. Why was the story that every Konoha baby had learned at their mother's knee being told to him by his oldest son? He slowly replied, yes, making fun of his son. Madara. Sama and Hashirama. Sama brokered peace and founded the first and most powerful hidden village. Itachi's voice was icy and detached as she said, but Madara betrayed the clan and the village. His son blinked and his red eyes gradually turned back to black as a massive plume of inky smoke engulfed the courtyard, engulfing Naruto and Sasuke, much to their mutual dismay, judging by their yelps. His ambitions proved too great and he broke the trust that made this village what it was. According to Fugaku, the Uchiha have always been faithful to the village, his voice growing even colder than his son's. It is not our fault if the Hokage and the council fail to trust us and lock us away in seclusion, using us as tools they can just throw away. If Sasuke were to disobey you and break a promise to you, father, you would be disappointed, wouldn't you? You would punish him and wonder if he deserved trust, but you would still love him, wouldn't you father? His son wove in a complex web of words around him, and Fugaku attempted to follow it but was unsuccessful saying, Sasuke is my son, I would be disappointed, of course, but he is my family, my son. Itachi muttered, Konoha has feared the Uchiha, that is true, as he fingered the ragged hem of his old athletic shirt. And it has unjustly forced us to live in a district far from others, making us live in isolation. Small wonder that we have grown distant from the village that we have helped found and guard. If Sasuke were to grow to hate you for your distance, wouldn't you push him away even further? wouldn't you feel as if you weren't deserving, not mature enough to deserve your trust again? Something tightened in Fugaku's chest. He said, Sasuke is not the Uchiha and I am not the council, as he stumbled through this new area that Itachi had gradually laid out before him. Itachi calmly replied, of course not, and Fugaku's chest constricted even more as he turned to face his eleven. Year. Old Chunin son. His little boy crawling over to him and demanding to be held up in the air seemed like it happened yesterday. The village must be protected by the Uchiha, Itachi added. But let us not forget that we are also a part of the village, father. With only a half. Seconds notice, Fugaku's younger son charged at him, streaks of dried ink covering every inch of exposed skin. Sasuke exclaimed, Papa, Papa, and jumped into his father's arms, instantly destroying Fugaku's hakama, which Makoto had hand. Stitched using the finest cotton and silk. His son clung to Fugaku's neck with sweaty, filthy fingers and rambled, did you see? Did you see? We pushed Kakashi.ni.san to the ground and then he disappeared and it was mama's roses and then we got all covered with the black stuff and papa it was so much fun, he said with a broad, contented grin. Fugaku attempted to speak sternly, but his voice came out weak and soft. Your mother would be very sad to see you so dirty, he said. After clearing his throat, he turned to face Hitaki, who was idly entering the room from the courtyard while firmly grasping the back of the boy's shirt and keeping Naruto off the ground. The silver-haired man was completely spotless, to his credit. He said sternly, thank you, and the other man simply gave him a bored nod. Itachi got up elegantly from the floor. 
I'll let mother know that Sasuke and Naruto both need a new change of clothes and a quick wash. Naruto moaned and wriggled in midair. Another bath? But I had one today already. Kakashi gave his load a slight shake. Sa, you're a mess right now. You'll get all the cushions dirty when we sit down to eat, Naruto. Itachi asked respectfully, if you'll follow me, and Kakashi and his blonde, haired burden followed his oldest son out the door. You too, Sasuke, Fugaku said, picking him up off his lap and placing him on the ground. Sasuke dutifully said, K, Papa, and scampered out the door, leaving behind tiny black footprints. He heard his younger son yell, wait for me, Ijit, and the Uzumaki boy respond with an unintelligible yell. Chakra flickered like ghostly flames in the eyes of Fugaku's mind as he closed his eyes and extended his senses. He sensed the bright flicker of Sasuke and the more subdued, silent, and tightly controlled presences of Kakashi and Itachi. The demon fox was definitely the source of the evil chakra that tarnished the Uzumaki boys, which resembled a roaring flame. He could sense Makoto's elegant flame far to his right, flickering in time with his own as she walked around the kitchen. Father, we are part of the village too. When did his eleven? Year dot old son become so intelligent. Makoto quietly remarked, Oh, you really don't have to do that, as she skillfully and effortlessly stacked the chopsticks and bowls. Kakashi said, It'll keep me away from Naruto, and then he checked on the two boys who were chatting happily over the newest comic books on the floor behind them using the reflective glass window above Makoto's head. He's busy being a six year old. I'm too old to play with him right now. With a wistful remark, they grow up so fast, Makoto carried a stack of bowls into the kitchen. Kakashi silently following behind. Seems like only yesterday Sasuke. Chan was throwing his mashed potatoes at the wall. He must have had excellent aim. Pulling on a pair of bright red gloves imprinted with the Uchiha crust. Makoto slid the bowls into the sink and turned on the faucet. Her eyes wrinkled at the corners as she grinned up at Kakashi. It took a week for Fugaku's hair to stop smelling like peas she claimed in a conspiratorial whisper while liberally dousing her sponge in soap. After seeing a vivid image of Fugaku covered in slimy green goo, Kakashi felt incredibly thankful that he had missed that specific stage of Naruto's development. He grabbed a dish towel and started carefully drying the dishes Makoto had cleaned. They settled into a relaxed routine, with Makoto occasionally humming a tune or idly discussing her sons. Unaware of the pricey craftsmanship of the porcelain dishware, Kakashi carefully stacked the last bowl in the cabinet after drying it. Kakashi.san, forgive me if this sounds impertinent but. After shutting the cabinet door, Kakashi cocked his head toward her, his dark eyes darting over her slender figure. He waited while she clenched her fists, her face displaying obvious struggle. Makoto spoke slowly, Uzumaki Kashina was a very dear friend of mine, and Kakashi's breath caught in his throat. He gave a tight nod. You were the Yandaimi's student, weren't you? Kakashi.san. After a brief pause, Makoto continued, her eyes growing resolute. Then you must have had a passing acquaintance with her. After the incident, it was Kashina.san who persuaded Minato. Sensei to allow him to stay in their guest room and who persuaded the Sandane to name Minato as his legal guardian. She always made sure to visit him in the hospital, clucking over the seals the medics had drawn up and replacing them with her own, and she had prepared him Kitsune Ramen on his birthdays. She had served as his mother in a sense. Yes, replied Kakashi sharply, I knew her. Then. Uzumaki.kun. Kakashi balled his right hand into a fist. Be careful with what you say, Uchiha.san, he said, making an effort to speak straight and smooth. Makoto's eyes were half fearful, half hopeful, and she released a tense breath, are you saying? He said evenly, I haven't said anything, and then he made his hand relax so it could fall at his side ineffectively. Kakashi vaguely recalled that Makoto had been a successful kunoichi before she retired to marry Fugaku and have children, and Makoto nodded. It was evident in her mannerisms and her will. Trained chakra signature. She said, that's enough, with a soft sigh in her voice. Thank you very much, Kakashi.san. Kakashi gave a shrug. I haven't said anything for you to thank me for. Makoto snapped off her rubber gloves and grinned. Kashina. Chan was very fond of you, you know. Kakashi took a swallow. He remarked, she was a good ninja, a credit to her village. Kakashi was silently appreciative of the privacy she provided him to control himself as Makoto turned away to the end of the kitchen. She pulled out a lovely plate of mochi in a hundred different colors, arranged in flowering patterns, after opening the refrigerator door. I think the boys would enjoy this treat, don't you think so Kakashi.san? Yes, Naruto would be thrilled, Kakashi said, 
committing to memory Makoto's tender, nurturing gaze that concealed a hard steel core. Maybe Makoto could be for Naruto what Kashina.san had been for him. When he said, very thrilled, Kashina.san enjoyed Mochi very much. Makoto gave him a knowing glance and carried the tray out the door, saying, then I'm sure Naruto.kun would enjoy them as well. Itachi's chakra unfurled whisper. Softly beside Kakashi as he heard the courteous creak of wood. He tucked a dagger back into his sandal and eased the automatic surge of chakra to his fingers. Silently, Hitaki. Senpei, Itachi said, I apologize for disturbing you. Kakashi shrugged and kept watching as Naruto and Sasuke ran around the courtyard below them like two cats, mindlessly tearing through Makoto's priceless roses. Sasuke seems very pleased to have found a playmate his age, the boy remarked nonchalantly. He doesn't have a great many friends in the district and since father refused to let him attend the civilian school. Kakashi leaned back on his hands and said, you seem fond of your brother, as the hard roof tiles dug into his skin. Itachi stated solemnly, of course, he's my brother, as though that were sufficient justification. There were too many illogical things. Why had Sasuke survived while Itachi killed his entire clan? And why did the massacre occur concurrently with Root's rise to power and Kakashi's departure from Anbu? Why? Why, why? Over the years, Kakashi had pieced together information and rummaged through documents in an attempt to determine the precise events of that fateful night when the clan heir lost his temper and murdered 246 people. He had gambled and gotten in touch with Itachi on his way back here, if only to keep the boy close, keep an eye on his mental health, and possibly use him against Danzo. However, nothing made sense. Itachi had never been known to kill a Konoha shinobi in his tenure as an Akatsuki agent. He had undoubtedly threatened, injured, maimed, and incapacitated it but never killed. Not even when he had the opportunity and Kakashi had been at his feet, helpless. Not when Sasuke was 12 and insane with desire for vengeance, not when Sasuke was 7 and defenseless. Kakashi had included a spiel about defending the village for this reason, among others, in the hopes that there would be more, it had also been successful. There were more details that he was unaware of, and Kakashi suspected that Fugaku and Danzo were involved. Clan politics. Kakashi's mouth twisted. From his father's shame to the Uchiha clan's anger over Obito's gift, he had undoubtedly seen more than his share of it. Given the Uchiha family's reputation in the village, Sosuke. Sama had already developed an obsession with power. By dragging his oldest son into the viper's nest, Fugaku was essentially the same and undoubtedly spreading the same foolishness to his own sons. Was it possible that Fugaku had made Itachi insane? But considering what he knew about the boy, that hardly made sense. What connection did it all have to the massacre? The tense silence that had developed between them was broken by Kakashi's comment, it's a beautiful home. My grandfather had it built during the third war in accordance with his views on the prominence of the Uchiha, said Itachi. Kakashi shrugged and said, I remember, it looks much better finished and with a family living in it. Itachi shifted almost imperceptibly on his feet and cocked his head like a bird. You've been here before. A long, long time ago. Although it was only seven or eight years ago in this body, Kakashi's mind considered it to be a lifetime ago. Kakashi tapped his shield over his forehead. Your uncle's gift had some repercussions. Itachi's voice trailed off, I'd heard some rumors but. They objected to having a non. Uchiha bear the Sharingan, Kakashi stated curtly. It didn't help I was the son of the White Fang. A disgrace. Itachi said, I think your father was a hero, and Kakashi turned to face the boy sitting next to him, his heart pounding. The worst people are those who desert their teammates. Your dad was a brave man. A hero was the White Fang. Obito. Kakashi croaked, what? The light of the stars above them reflected in dark eyes. The White Fang saved the lives of six shinobi on that mission. It was wrong of the village to condemn him for that. Itachi sighed. It's odd that Uchiha Obito, the clan's black sheep and enduring failure, would reappear as the strongest Uchiha to be born in a generation. How appropriate, however, the massacre. Kakashi suppressed the urge to snarl. He was running out of time and had insufficient information and too few pieces to solve the damned puzzle that was hovering in front of him. Kakashi said, the village has condemned many, choosing his words carefully. My father, Naruto, the Uchiha. Itachi jerked. Yes, said the boy. Fear has been known to misguide. But we must still protect the village, because it holds the most important thing in the world. Curious, Itachi raised his gaze to the older man. Kakashi muttered, the future, and jerked his head at the two boys who were wrestling on the ground and laughing. 
Itachi's normally composed voice became hesitant as he spoke after another lengthy silence. Kakashi. Senpei. I believe. That there are some in this clan that are making. Less than wise choices. Kakashi scratched his nose nonchalantly as his ears perked up. Oh. There have been. Itachi picked absently at a clay tile, using his fingernail to scratch something that could not be read. Angry conversations. About the village's mistrust. The decline of Uchiha power. Kakashi's face was unreadable as he pondered Itachi's words, you don't mean. Who knows what a frightened animal, backed into a corner, might do when it feels that it is going to be devoured. The breath caught in Kakashi's chest, a coup d'a copyright tat. A fucking coup was being planned by the Uchiha. Convinced of the loyalty of a founding clan, he had never even bothered to consider the coup among all the theories he had developed over the years. A coup. Rumor had it that the Uchiha, who were strong but incensed at being ignored in favor of others, such as the Hyuga, were unhappy. However, Kakashi felt as though someone had punched him in the chest in order to topple the council and possibly kill the Hokage. Kakashi realized numbly that it was no surprise that Itachi had killed them all. The alternative was that internal strife would split Konoha apart, making it difficult for the remaining hidden villages to survive. Furthermore, the massacre fair stank of Danzo. While in Anbu, he must have somehow coerced the boy next to him into defying his own family. At all costs, eliminate threats. It was so logical. Itachi kept his brother alive, which is why he had never killed a Konoha Nin. He was too devoted to him to murder him. Danzo undoubtedly killed Itachi's family out of love. Below him, he saw Sasuke leap into a flying tackle and crush Naruto to the ground while they both screamed bloody murder at one another. Just collateral damage, his pack was destroyed by Danzo and Fugaku's fucking ambitions. Two young boys, ruined by ambition and pride. Kakashi was ill. Kakashi blinked once and twice as a bracing hand lightly touched his shoulder. Itachi, he uttered softly. You must listen to me. We need to prevent this. This, whatever this is, from happening. The hand clamped down on his shoulder. I have tried my best, Kakashi. Senpei, but. Kakashi violently shook his head. His voice was low as he said, there is much, much more going on than you think. Itachi froze, and the two of them turned to face the kids below. But if the council catches even so much as a word of this. They wouldn't dare. Under his mask, Kakashi's mouth twisted as he asked, what do you think happened to all the clans with Keke Jenke in Kiri? One man with the ability to walk through shadows tries to assassinate the Mizukage. The next day, an edict goes out ordering the death of all with special abilities. Itachi released Kakashi's shoulder and backed away into the darkness, his face pale and wan. The Uchiha have played with fire so long that we have forgotten how dangerous it is. Kakashi. Senpei, there are a few of us in the clan who, who want to protect the village and our families. Kakashi's lips grew thinner as he said, we are running out of time. The council is restless as it is. I don't think I have to tell you about how Danzo is feeling. Itachi crossed his arms over his chest and declared, I will notify them immediately, but it's the clan elders who will prove to be the most trouble. Clan. Village relations must be strengthened, Kakashi stated without meaning to do so. I'll speak on behalf of the clan during council meetings and privately with the Hokage, but I can only do so much. The clan needs to make this happen. Fugaku must get this done. Unconsciously channeling chakra, Kakashi frowned and pressed his fingers into the terracotta roof. With a drooping eye and as much disinterest as he could manage, Kakashi responded to Itachi's intense gaze, saying, you speak as if you know what will happen. Oh, not really, said Kakashi in a hazy voice, but I know the council, I know shinobi villages, I know war. Itachi took a deep breath, you don't mean Sasuke. Kakashi wrote, you and your friends have your work cut out for yourselves, as his fingers moved like a hot knife through hardened clay. Or the clan's precious future might never happen. As a man worthy of his station, Fugaku bowed and said, it was good of you to come, with a rough tone. The Hitaki boy grinned and bobbed like a fool but Fugaku could see the sharp mind behind the ugly mask. Oh, well, it was a wonderful meal. Makoto said softly, please, do come again, and she tightly gripped his small, calloused hand. Fugaku swallowed, and his wife's touch caused something inside of him to soften. He said slowly, dinner again would be no bad thing, and his wife's chakra glowed brightly. Although Sasuke boasted, come over next time and I'll show you the cool shuriken trick Aniki showed me, Fugaku was too proud of his son to chastise him for treating the guests so badly. Naruto jumped up and down, barely restrained by the Hitaki's hold on his shoulder. I'll bring Ryu. 
Chan with me, he said. He knows all these cool tricks and maybe we can teach him to do shuriken tricks too. A sly expression crossed Sasuke's face as he appeared intrigued. Dog tricks? Sasuke continued to bring stray animals home despite Fugaku's constant ban on pets due to mess, and he would throw fierce tantrums when Fugaku brought the newest bird or kitten into the woods. He could feel something clearly wrong about Sasuke's face. Yeah, dog tricks, said the happily blonde boy. S me and me. San's friend, Ryu. Chan's the best. The demon. Child that he was, Sasuke, turned to face him with big, bright eyes. He said, Papa, in a voice that sounded dejected. May Ryu. Chan and Naruto come and visit soon? Well. As more tears welled up in Sasuke's eyes, Fugaku swallowed. He muttered, I'll think about it, and held his wife's hand for balance. As Sasuke applauded, the two kids performed a victory dance ritual in which they threw their arms in the air, jumped up and down, and yelled like little thugs. All right, that's enough, Fugaku abruptly stated. The guests must be on their way now. Sasuke instantly re-entered the line, but his facial lines were content. In some respects, Fugaku reflected dejectedly, his children were worse than the council's power struggles. The Uzumaki boy bowed unsteadily, his bright blonde hair flopping as he did so. He heard the Hitaki boy whisper, Bo, to his charge. It was odd how much the child reminded him of a deceased and long, gone Uzumaki. It was very good to see you, Uzumaki.kun, Kakashi. Senpei. His oldest son said, bowing back with grace, maybe a little more deeply than a clan heir should, but Fugaku could see how much his son respected the Hitaki. Fascinating. It might be beneficial to fortify the Uchiha and Hitaki's relationship during council sessions. Hitaki bobbed and squatted down, allowing Naruto to eagerly climb up onto his back with slender arms wrapped around the masked man's neck. We'll see you soon, Hitaki said. The night is late and I don't want to impose on your hospitality any longer. Fugaku exhaled a sigh of relief when the pair with gold and silver hair vanished with a single flicker of chakra. Makoto grinned and squeezed his hands, her dark eyes lovingly observing him, they were very lovely, she said. Naruto's not lovely, Sasuke remarked sarcastically, his bottom lip protruding in a pout, he's a boy. Sasuke, forewarned Fugaku. Makoto gave her son a gentle head pat, if he's not lovely, then what is he? Itachi surprised the family by responding to Makoto's query. Silently, a good friend, he said. Looking up at his oldest son, Sasuke smiled. Exactly, he said. Kakashi woke up silently as a chakra string twanged outside his window. He had a kanai in his hand. He always slept with blades under his pillow, and a burning chakra in his left hand. Outside his window, something was tripping his seals, and Kakashi used his chakra to reach out and probe the guarded presence in an irritated manner. He believed that his anti chakra seals outside his window had deterred the damned couriers. Kakashi kept the blade firmly in his hand but allowed his chakra to fade when he realized the presence. He jerked the shade up with a rough hand, exposing Tenzu's wide eyes and even paler than normal face. Kakashi jerked the window open with a bit more force than necessary after Tenzo tapped on the glass with shaking hands outside open now emergency now now. Wearing only pajama bottoms and carrying a single kanai, he slithered out. Tenzu's hackles stood up as he growled, what is it, did someone die? No, Tenzu's face turned white as he swallowed. Kakashi wasn't sure if it was because of his intention to kill or the news he was bringing. Most likely both. Kakashi discovered that he couldn't really give a damn just yet. Sandane. Sama had promised to grant Naruto two months of leave to care for him while he slept ten feet away. The smell of Tenzu's fear didn't help him feel any better, and he was still worn out from his trip to the Uchiha district. Then what is it? Delta squads being sent out on a suicide mission. Kakashi's knuckles widened as he held on to the window frame. In his other hand, his kanai shook. Dully, he said, what? Captain. Genma just received. I didn't know who else to ask but. Kakashi's eye was closed. Danzo, he said, there was no question. Tenzo nodded pitifully, the moonlight highlighting the dark circles beneath his eyes, straight from the mouth of the councilman. Fuck. Tenzo slipped in, locked the bar, and Kakashi closed the window. He said, stand back, and put his kanai in his mouth. Then, with hot chakra coursing through his coils, he made a series of seals and slammed his palms against the wall. The dim light of his security seals activating illuminated his dark room for a considerable amount of time, radiating so much chakra that Kakashi's eyes watered at the sight. Tenzo said, Senpei, 
those are at least s rank seals with a tone of wonder that would have delighted his 12 year dot old self kakashi 30 was simply exhausted he said tell me exactly what happened and then he dropped into the same position kanai in hand hands clasped behind his back tenzo straightened instantly and instinctively dropped into a ready position at about 2000 hours councilman shimura danzo summoned captain shiranui to attend to him captain received an s rank mission from councilman danzo detailing the elimination of target gari of iwagakir of the bakudan keke jenke and the explosion core failure is not acceptable and konoha must not be implicated in this mission delta squad is to leave the village in three days time and expected back in the village in two months kakashi rarely lost his temper in actuality he rarely received anything guy or naruto were better suited for intense emotion while kakashi simply wanted a book tea and a peaceful afternoon spent with one of his dogs however as tenzo gazed back at him unsurely kakashi dimly realized that he was fucking angry at the moment kakashi stated all Anbu squads are given three weeks of leave in order to integrate new members into their team, as she spoke quietly. Tenzo took a deep breath. Tenzo said, See. Councilman Danzo said that this mission could be trusted to no other, with a slight crack in his voice. And that Uchiha Itachi had proved himself particularly well before. Oh? Asked Kakashi. Is that so? Why? Yes. And is Councilman Danzo also aware that Konoha has an extremely tentative peace right now with Iwa and that Gari is currently listed in all five of the major bingo books, noted to be worth at least 75 million Ryu dead and 150 Ryu alive, and that he has managed to survive every assassination attempt for the past 15 years? Councilman Danzo. He said that Captain Shiranui was not to question his orders, Tenzo murmured faintly. Kakashi gripped his kanai handle tightly behind his back and asked, did he? Senpei, why? You're bleeding. Kakashi discovered that he was grasping the kanai by its blade rather than its handle when he unclasped his hands behind his back. His left hand's palm was severely cut by the edge. So I see, he said, placing the blood kanai on his desk calmly and slowly. After swallowing once more, Tenzu's sunken brown eyes gazed anxiously at Kakashi's bloody hands. I didn't know who else to go to. He concluded in a low voice, Captain Shiranui was updating his will when I came. Unconsciously, Kakashi drew out his desk chair and took a seat, clenching his fist to halt the bleeding. Councilman Shimura fucking Danzo. Danzo was sending his team on a mission that most likely would not succeed. Not in favor of motherfucking Gari. Kakashi gave a deep growl. The Hokage gave the Gari of Iwa the order to flee on sight after they had successfully destroyed a battalion of Konoha soldiers on their own. Gari. Additionally, Danzo had given this order in order to rid Anbu of Kakashi's allies and friends and to create space for the root agents he was undoubtedly training. In essence, Danzo was eradicating his teammates because they were connected to him. He intended to murder Danzo. The pale face of Tenzo appeared in the distance. You, you can't kill Danzo, Senpei. Kakashi blinked. Had he actually said that? Tenzo said, you did, with a somewhat contrite expression. But if you kill him, you'll mark the criminal and whatever Danzu's planning will probably still go on. With a dull bell ringing in his head all the time, Kakashi closed his eye and felt Obito's eye begin to pound. All right, he muttered. This is what we'll do. Go to Genma immediately and fill out form 36B. As. Ask him to request me and give the paperwork to Morita along with a box of candy ginger. She'll have it filed within the hour. Then tell Genma to brief the team and have them meet me on the roof of the rusty kanai in about three hours. Everyone but Itachi. I'll take care of him. Tenzo saluted and made his way to the window, where he waited for Kakashi to remove the seals with a quick flash of hand seals. Understood. I apologize for bringing you into this, Senpei, he said, furrowing his brows. No, Kakashi said softly as he opened the window, his silver hair rustled by the evening breeze. I'm sorry for involving you. Now, go. You have three hours to get everyone and everything together. Pack for a long-term infiltration mission, sealing scrolls, tags, disguise kits, everything. Tenzo dutifully said, yes, sir, and then he flew out the window and vanished into the night. Kakashi closed the window once more and started working. With a kanai brittle in his hands and an elegant robe, Fugaku swept out of the house, Sharingan swirling dangerously in his eyes. He yelled at Shinji, Mariko's youngest son, the sentry who was kneeling on the ground, what's the emergency? Though too impulsive for his own good, the boy is smart. The boy stumbled, S. Sir, and with shaking hands, 
held up a scroll sealed with chakra, not quite daring to look directly at the powerful clan head. A summons dropped this off at the gate and said it was for your eyes only, Fugaku. Sama. From the tower? Fugaku inquired, his voice tinged with alarm as he automatically forced more chakra into his eyes. When Shinji said, N.no, Fugaku. Sama, his voice broke. F. From Hitaki Kakashi, sir. With heavy silk robes rustling in the air, Fugaku rushed down the stairs and re. Holstered the kanai. So soon after the dinner, and at this hour, what could the damn boy possibly want? At the last second, Fugaku made himself slow down and dignifiedly reach for the scroll. Streams of chakra coiled tightly around the scroll, sealed only to open to a particular chakra signature, according to what his Sharingan could detect. Very, very clever work. He cut his thumb with a knife and ran it over the seal, the dark kanji characters ravenously consuming his blood. When he read the missive inside, Fugaku nearly raised his hand to dismiss the boy as the scroll unrolled with a faint puff of smoke. The boy was requesting the impossible A by the Shodai. Shinji, Fugaku said slowly as the moonlight caused his Sharingan to spin wildly, did the summons mention anything else? A. Oh, maybe that Hitaki.san would be by. Soon? To confirm the response? Shinji gasped. When the boy opened his mouth again, Fugaku waved a hand dismissively and asked wearily, is that a question or an answer, boy? No, don't answer that. Go back to your duty, you did well. Your mother would be pleased with your efforts. Shinji's forehead nearly touched the gravel path as she bowed deeply, he said, your words honor me, Fugaku. Sama, and for once, he didn't seem to be able to speak without stuttering. After a slight chakra twist, the boy vanished back into the darkness leaving Fugaku by himself with a bloody thumb and a strong urge to choke the Hitaki boy. Makoto, Fugaku uttered, gradually raising his voice. Half a second later, his beloved wife was at his side, her hair only slightly blown by the body flicker. She put a thin hand on his arm and said softly, Yes, beloved husband? The lines of Fugaku's craggy face deepened as he said, Hitaki requests that we look after the Uzumaki demon boy while he is away on an extended mission. Months, it may seem. No, the boy liked throttling too much. Using the genjutsu they typically employed to interrogate criminals at the station, Fugaku would first trap him and a. Oh, Sasuke will be so pleased. I'll have to prepare an extra room and of course, Naruto. Chan would have to need an extra set of bedding and a place at the table. What? Fugaku asked, his thoughts of torturing the Hitaki boy long since gone, as he gazed at his modest wife. Makoto said, Naruto. Chan is such a sweet boy, of course we must help a fellow clan head in need and look after him, with her dark eyes wide and endearing. It's very brave of Hitaki.san to trust us with his heir, isn't it dear? But he's, Fugaku stammered out the ideal phrase, the boy. Makoto nodded and tightened her hold on Fugaku's arm. A very strong one, she said. To hold back a force so devastating to the village. You'll allow this, won't you, dear? Fugaku snarled, I'll think about it and dragged his wife back to the house while inadvertently synchronizing their steps. Outrageous of the boy to ask us such a thing on such short notice. Makoto responded amiably, I'm sure he has his reasons, and planted a gentle peck on her husband's cheek. Now, I'll have to ask Itachi.kun to help me air out the bedding and we must have the two of them stay for breakfast at least. Yesterday, Kenji.san had a whole fresh catch of mackerel straight from the coast and he promised to set aside a few for me. It would go splendidly with the miso and rice and there's the natto I was planning on. The resolute wool of a housewife and a tray of tea was stronger than even copy ninja Hitaki Kakashi, master of a thousand jutsu, former Anbu hound, Yandaimi Hokage's proto-copyright ga copyright, and son of the late White Fang. Before he knew it, Kakashi was led into a room with Itachi and Fugaku, and a plate of freshly cut fruit and a cup of steaming green tea were set on the table in front of him. It appeared that Fugaku had long accepted his wife's domestic schemes and was already comfortable on his cushion, drinking tea, with Itachi seated at his right hand like a faithful retainer. Makoto put a soft, comforting hand on his shoulder and said, let me know if you need anything else, but not before glancing at his bandaged hand. The sliding door closed in front of her with a drab finality as she swept out of the room. Fugaku's damned smug voice said, an unusual request, and Kakashi struggled to control his temper. He reminded himself to remain calm and tried not to consider how close Danzo was, how simple it would be to cut his throat and hang him on the village walls as a warning to anyone who dared to oppose his pack. Kakashi drank his tea instead. As Kakashi remarked, 
Unusual circumstances demand unusual measures, he questioned whether Ichidori through Danzu's chest was too swift or too kind. My presence has been requested for a mission and I thought it best to leave Naruto in the care of people I trust. Fugaku's eyebrow went up, I would hardly call our brief acquaintance a particularly close one. Kakashi's slender hold on his murderous intent waned as he exposed his teeth beneath his mask, then he made himself release his hold on the cup, saying, better with the enemy I know than the enemy that I don't. Itachi said, if I may ask, for the first time since the three had come into the room, but it seems that your attire is different this morning, Kakashi. Senpei. Kakashi tugged at his black cloak's hem. I volunteered for a classified mission, he said, his lips quivering. Fugaku squinted his eyes, you don't mean. Kakashi put the teacup back on the table and pondered what Danzu's fear might smell like. It seems he thinks that he can do whatever he likes with the core. Sour and sickly, likely twisted by hate and darkness, he seems to have wrought a great many unfavorable changes in my short absence. Including the planned elimination of my old team. Fugaku said, you have made a powerful enemy, with unreadable dark eyes. Kakashi remarked, oh, I wouldn't say that, the air in the room abruptly became 10 degrees colder, and Kakashi pondered gloomily that Danzu's death would likely be the first he would enjoy. The councilman has made some very bad choices, he's made an enemy of me. He was aware of some genjutsu that, when used carefully, could be just as devastating as the Tsukiyomi, despite not being as strong or dangerous. Danzo was the source, the reason his pack died. Because of his ambitions, Danzo had nearly killed Naruto, destroyed Sakura, tore apart Sasuke's psyche, and pushed five shinobi countries to war. Kakashi came to the realization that death was too good for the sack of shit. Itachi whispered, Kakashi, Senpei, and Kakashi blinked quickly to get out of his reverie. Strangely, Itachi and Fugaku appeared paler, and he could smell the strong stench of fear in the air. Oh! The intent that he was radiating was suppressed by Kakashi, who gradually coiled the power within himself into a tight knot. I would be in your debt, Uchiha. Don't know, Kakashi said with a smile, if you would be so kind as to look after Naruto in my absence. I. Fugaku swallowed after pausing. It would be my honor, Hitaki. Don't know. Your trust in my clan is one that I do not hold lightly. Kakashi bowed his head and his shoulders relaxed slightly, he uttered the words, your generosity knows no bounds, and he quietly exhaled in relief as his hurriedly assembled plan began to come together. He retrieved a packet of seals from the sleeve of his bulky anbu cloak and set them on the table. Security seals, he clarified when Fugaku gave him a curious glance, to keep you and your household safe. He added inaudibly, referring primarily to Naruto and Sasuke. Making strong seals that could be readily incorporated into the existing Uchiha seals had taken a good hour. The Uchiha household would not suffer any harm if it were used appropriately, directions are enclosed. With a slightly impressed expression, Fugaku accepted the packet with dignity and put it aside to be carefully examined later. No matter how much Kakashi could smell Fugaku's desire to open gifts in front of the giver, it would be impolite. Kakashi said, I don't mean to be rude, but time is running short, and quickly got up from the ground, covering his shock of silvery hair with his dark hood. With a discreet adjustment of his hood, he signed at Itachi, you have my deepest gratitudes, Uchiha. Dono, meet me outside. Both Fugaku and his son got up, and Fugaku bowed his head as he and Itachi, a well, oiled machine, rose together. Go swiftly so you may return successfully. In the back of his mind, a voice full of cynicism questioned whether this would be his final encounter with the Uchiha clan head. For the first time, Naruto seemed to realize how big Kakashi's absence was when he asked, Mission? You're going to be gone? Naruto swallowed, and tears began to well up in his dark blue Isa Minato. Sensei's eyes. With hesitation, Kakashi put his bandaged hand on Naruto's head. Only for a very little while. I'll be back before you know it. Naruto whimpered, his small hands buried deep in Ryu's fur, why do you have to go? In an attempt to console Naruto, the dog licked at his shirt and let out a pitiful whine. Kakashi declared, I've sworn to do my duty to the Hokage, you remember him, right? Naruto furiously scrubbed at his eyes and wrinkled his nose, asking, old Gigi? He's a dumb old man and he doesn't even like ramen, why do you have to do stuff for him? When Kakashi said, he protects and leads Konoha, it became much more difficult for him to speak. Oddly, his throat seemed to be constricting, as if he were getting a cold. It's your dream to be the Hokage, right Naruto.kun? Naruto said, I don't want you to go, in a very, very low voice. Kakashi's eye was closed. In his mind, 
He could still picture father's wide back, his hair pale against the flak vest's dark green, Tanto strapped to his hip, and his body getting smaller and smaller as he moved farther away. From the corner of his eye, Kakashi saw Itachi approaching them. I'm sorry, Naruto, he said, and withdrew. I have to go. Be good and listen to Fugaku.san and Makoto.san, alright? He pushed his legs to move, up and down, away from his most valuable person in the world, and turned away, forcing himself to leave the little boy behind. Itachi joined him with ease after two rapid heartbeats, the younger boy hardly reaching his elbow. Itachi remarked, good luck with your mission, senpei. Kakashi tried to joke, what, no complaints about leaving you back home, but it didn't work. All he could think about was Naruto and Ryu behind him, his two small pack members by themselves without him. Itachi cocked his head and said, I could see the logic of your decisions. With Delta Squad away, the councilman has more control over the core. My presence will at least deter him from both acting against the commander's interests and against Uzumaki.kun. There are also the clan politics to think of. We are few but growing and my absence will surely result in unrestrained actions by the elders. Pulling at the hem of his hood, Kakashi remarked, I always did think you were a better genius than me, keep them safe for me, will you? Of course, replied Itachi. If I may be so forward, I would like to request Delta Squad safe return to the village in two months time. I have grown fond of their presence. Kakashi smiled for the first time since Tenzo had unexpectedly stopped by his window. How was Dango with Tenzo? Itachi's mouth corner pulled upward. He remarked, enjoyable and informative, I had never realized that so many new varieties of Dango existed. The words, I can't make any promises, were spoken quietly by Kakashi, but I'll try my best. Itachi said, that's all anyone ever asks for, and he raised his fist in salute, good hunting, captain. Kakashi gave Itachi his own salute by lightly tapping his forehead protector, good hunting, Itachi. Genma was in the process of updating his will and packing up his belongings so that the administrators could more easily distribute them to his family when Tenzo knocked on his door, looking white, faced and as though he had done a few rounds with Kumo.nin. Because death swooped past him almost daily, reminding him of how little time he had left in the world, he believed that death and Genma were no longer just acquaintances but rather neighbors. On some days, he questioned how he had survived the third shinobi war at all, and on other days, he questioned how he had survived this far in Anbu while maintaining the majority of his mental abilities. However, he primarily thanked the gods, his luck, and continued working. It appeared that his luck had finally run out today. Whether he liked it or not, he was going to die. He said, come in, assuming Tenzo would avoid the tripwires and other traps he had placed close to the entrance. According to his logic, Genom had no real interest in getting to know you if you weren't competent enough to spot and stay away from them. Captain. Genma raised an eyebrow and looked up. Dryly, you look like shit, he said. I. I met with Kakashi. Senpei, Tenzo said, grasping Kakashi. Senpei tightly. As pitiful as that sounded, Kakashi was most likely close to Tenzu's only family in the world, classified Anbu mission or not. This conversation was with Captain Tenzo, who most likely forgot more secrets than most people do in their lifetimes. His sister would likely need some of his pictures to add to the family shrine she had in her home, so Genma politely asked, did you give him your goodbyes? Before returning to going through his photo albums and stacking them in a box that was clearly marked a Shiranui family. Tenzo said slowly, not exactly, and something in the younger man's voice caused Genma to look up, his mouth quivering. Genma remarked, what do you mean, not exactly? Kakashi. Senpei said that you should file form 36B as requesting him and file it with Morita.san right away along with a box of candy ginger. The team is supposed to meet up on the roof of the Rusty Kanai in about two and a half hours, packed for a long-term infiltration mission. He would take care of Itachi separately. Tenzo breathed deeply and then swallowed. Genma gave a blink. I'm sorry, did you say Form 36B, as? Tenzo said, yes, with a slightly defensive tone. The cunning jerk. With a long, low whistle, Genma felt a glimmer of hope for the first time since he had been summoned to Councilman Danzu's feet. He's having me request him as a non. And with special associate specifically for the mission. And he has the clearance rank for it which means. Tenzu's voice was high and hopeful as he asked, Captain's going to be back on the team. The child was right to call Captain, Captain, and Genma couldn't blame him. Even Genma still considered Kakashi to be Captain. Presumably at the Hokage's request. Genma was merely covering for the man while he was on vacation, watching the demon brat. 
There was a reason Delta Squad was considered the best team in the entire core and why space on the squad was so highly sought after. They had the fewest casualties and the highest mission completion rate. Captain Hitaki, who was arguably the best and most formidable ninja in all of Anbu, after the commander, believed you had what it took to join Delta Squad. Because Captain Hitaki fucking Kakashi never left a man behind, joining Delta Squad meant that you would be going through the most difficult, worst, and most difficult missions and that you would return to the village alive. Additionally, the return of the captain raised the possibility that Delta Squad would make it through this insane shitshow of a mission. After giving his neighbor death a warm wave good dot bye, Genma pushed his trash box off the desk and raised his feet. Genma grinned and said, let's get that paperwork filed, run out and get me a box of the candy that Moria likes, would you? And let Raida know that he doesn't have to pack his shit up, because the odds of his coming back alive just went up. With a small smile on his lips, Tenzo saluted. Yes Captain Genma, sir. Genma demanded, what are you sticking around for? Get out, we've got a mission to prepare for in less than two hours, get your ass moving, rookie. With the slender grace of a cat, Tenzo rolled his eyes and headed for the window. Genma pretended not to hear the parting shot, but he wasn't sure if he was dreaming it or not, he wasn't a damn rookie anymore. That the rookie was at last developing a backbone of his own was encouraging. This, said Kakashi, displaying a bundle of documents Genma had given him is shit. The stack of papers instantly turned to ashes when a finger ignited a tiny, fiery chakra flame. Shodai's balls, said Raida, with a profound expression of admiration. Intel's gonna have a hissy fit when they see what you did to their information, Captain. Assume the worst, Kakashi said coldly as he wiped the dust from his hands. Danzo gave out the assassination to eliminate my team, he's not going to make it easy for us to complete the mission. With his hands stuffed in his cloak pockets, Genma rocked on his heels and argued, how are you so sure that Danzu's out to get us? We're the best team in the core, maybe he thought we could handle it, sir. Danzo personally summons you to assassinate one of the most notorious ninja in the five shinobi nations, an user of a Keke Genke that's had particularly devastating effects during the third shinobi war against Konoha. If any word of this mission leaks out, the treaty between Iwa and Konoha would be broken and all blame of the next war would be pinned on us. If we fail, which is very likely, and we manage to keep Konoha's involvement quiet which is unlikely, Danzo can easily pretend that we were sent out on a different, less politically dangerous assignment. After all, Kakashi said with a thin grin. Most Anbu missions leave no paper trace. He can make up whatever he wants, he's a councilman and we're just pawns in a game. Tenzo said slowly, but if we come back, as understanding began to appear on his face. As Raida said, Danzu's caught between a rock and an angry Konoha Nin, his dark eyes were full of amusement. We show up with Gari's head, keep Konoha quiet in this whole mess, maybe implicate some other fucking village and everyone congratulates us. Meanwhile, Hokage. Sama's mighty pissed at Danzo for fucking around with his private force and giving us such a stupid ass mission. Maybe even take a good hard long look at Anbu and stop whatever Danzu's doing to the core, Genma said in a voice that was noticeably quiet. You know? Kakashi said in a neutral tone. Raida remarked, they don't even act human, and Tenzo nodded in agreement. Raida shrugged and said, how could we not know? And when you left? There were more of them, Kakashi added somberly. All the more reason we need to successfully complete the mission. Yeah, you know, no big deal, Genma said, tinkering with the Senban. Infiltrate Iwa, kill an insanely talented shinobi without revealing that we're involved, make it out of the village alive. Take his body back for tea and I and report to the Hokage about what a fucker Danzo was for assigning this shit mission. Kakashi said, all in a day's work for Delta Squad, and there was a faint undertone of tension in his voice that nobody on the roof could miss. Raida put his hands up in the air and said, hey, hey, we'll get through this alright, Captain. Just think about how much fun you'll have thinking about fucking with Danzo for the next two months. I've already started, spoke Kakashi in a low voice. He won't dare to mess with my team again. When Sasuke woke up, Naruto was there, eating breakfast with Aniki, Mama, and Father, and there was grilled mackerel, which was his favorite food in the world. Suddenly, it was the best day ever. It was difficult because Naruto was sitting next to him, Aniki was home, and Sasuke wanted to play more games and show him the gardens around the house where Aniki had built him a cool treehouse in the old maple tree. Of course, he had to say good morning in his indoor voice and then eat breakfast quietly. As soon as he finished his bowl of rice, Sasuke blurted out, thank you for theme Almama, and pulled Naruto from the table and into his room. Sasuke. With a sigh, 
Sasuke released Naruto's arm and walked sluggishly back to the table, praying that the lecture about manners and not running in the house would not come up again. Naruto hasn't finished his meal yet, informed father. Oddly, Naruto's bowl was still half, full of fish and rice when Sasuke glanced over at it, and it appeared as though he had hardly touched his miso. That was strange because Naruto consumed almost half of the mochi snacks mama had provided for dessert last night and nearly three times as much as Sasuke did. Naruto was a foodie. Naruto said, no, soke, fuguki.san, and he didn't even bat an eyelid when Sasuke hissed, Papa's name is Fugaku, dummy, and jabbed him in the ribs. Mama said, you should still eat more, and she appeared concerned, much like when Aniki was ill or injured while on a mission. Was Naruto ill? Like Mama, Sasuke placed a hand on Naruto's forehead. Naruto did appear somewhat depressed and uncharacteristically Naruto. Even his bright orange shirt gave him a droopy appearance. Naruto muttered, I'm not hungry, and he made a strange little frown, can I go with Sasuke now? When father said, all right, Sasuke almost leapt to his feet, but he remembered his manners and thanked him in the sweetest, most polite way possible. Father said, don't make a mess, boys, and Sasuke quickly dragged Naruto out of the dining room and into his own room. In just a few minutes, they had arrived at his room after he dashed down the hallways and skittered expertly in his socks across the hardwood floors. Whoa, Naruto exclaimed, appearing slightly more radiant than before and crossing his arms over his chest. That was fun. Sasuke boastfully remarked, me and Aniki do it all the time. Sasuke mimicked Itachi sliding across the floor with his hand and puffed his chest out proudly when Naruto appeared suitably impressed. Aniki calls it sock sliding. Sept we can't tell mama or father because they'll yell at us but Aniki can go super fast like swoosh. When Naruto said, Ni.san and I play a game too with Ryu. Chan in. His face collapsed and he began to cry, turning an unsightly mottled red. Sasuke placed a hand on Naruto's forehead once more and inquired, what's wrong? Perhaps Naruto was truly ill and had come here to receive medical attention from Mama. Naruto sniffed, his voice strange and clogged. Kakashi.ni has to go away on a mission, he said, and he left me here all alone with only Ryu. Sasuke said, oh, and took Naruto's hand once more as they made their way outside to the gardens. He was able to resolve this. Naruto muttered, where are we going? With a slightly startled yet excited expression on his face as they slid across the floor. In a matter of minutes, they had left the house proper and entered the gardens, where Mama had planted more of her lovely rose flowers. Sasuke scurried up onto the wooden platform Aniki had constructed and made his way directly to the maple tree. He called out, come on, as he leaned over the edge and held out an open hand. Before he took Sasuke's hand, Naruto only briefly displayed signs of fear. Covered by a worn regulation blanket Itachi had given him, and shaded by dazzling red leaves, he scrambled up the tree and onto the platform. Naruto exclaimed, wow, as he gazed at Sasuke's hidden ninja hideout with his vivid blue eyes. Sasuke revealed, whenever Aniki goes, way, I come up here, as he pulled over a box of rusty, blunted shuriken and kanai that he had gathered from the forest. We made it together and I play up here all the time with him. Curiously, Naruto scrunched up his face and his facial whiskers, asking, Atachi's a ninja too? Like for real? I thought you were just making stuff up? He's a chunin, Sasuke declared, rolling his eyes simultaneously. To be honest, Naruto can be such a fool at times. That means he's super strong and good and he's only 11. Naruto said, 11's old, with disgust, and Kakashi.ni, sans 20. Sasuke scowled. That's like super old, he's a ninja too, in it he? What rank is he? Naruto gave his head a scratch. The words, I-E-H-E-H, -E -E don't know, he said. But I know that he's super strong and everything and he's a great ninja, yeah. Yes, Naruto was undoubtedly a moron. He's gonna come back from the mission, Sasuke declared with assurance. He and Aniki are great ninja so he'll come back so stop worrying. Yeah, he's gonna come back, Naruto repeated, his eyes forming tiny lines of smile. When he was going through his box of super shinobi tools, Sasuke asked, so, whatcha wanna play? We can practice with our weapons or we could play tag and we can maybe visit Aunt Mariko about. A cloud of red maple leaves swirled around Itachi as he fell onto the platform. With a whoop of delight, Sasuke dropped his box and headed directly for Itachi's knees. Aniki. Sasuke was too delighted to see his brother to be bothered by Itachi's foolish prodding behavior. Naruto and Itachi could now play pirates and ninjas, and perhaps Itachi could train them. 
Later, they could all enjoy okonomiyaki from Kanichi, San's store. Itachi took something from his pocket and said, Kakashi. Senpei left behind something I think the two of you would enjoy. Sasuke focused on the pile of papers he was holding. Naruto exhaled, exploding ink papers, and Sasuke gave his friend a wide, eyed stare, like yesterday? Even though Itachi was Sasuke's aniki, he nodded and tousled Naruto's hair, allowing him to briefly serve as Naruto's aniki while Kakashi.ni.san was away. Perhaps. Yeah? Naruto roared as he charged into Sasuke and Itachi, but Aniki managed to pick them both up off the ground and spin them in a huge circle. Sasuke was convinced that this was the greatest day in history. So that's it for today. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe to the channel for more awesome stories like this. Thank you. See you all in my next video.